Good evening. It is six o'clock and I call this regularly scheduled Dunwoody City Council meeting on July 11th, 2022 to order. Um, Councilman Lambert, can you please lead us in the invocation and the pledge? At this meeting, help us to make decisions which keep us faithful to our mission and reflect our values. Give us strength to hold to our purpose, wisdom to guide us, and a keen perception to lead us. And above all, keep us charitable as we deliberate. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Before we go to public comment, I just feel the need to take a moment of privilege, if that's okay with council, to clarify that there's nothing about Tilly Mill Road, nothing about multi-purpose trails, sidewalks, or paths on Tilly Mill Road on tonight's agenda. We are thrilled you have all joined with us and we want to hear what you have to say, but I also want you to know that over the next few weeks and months that there will be many opportunities for public input on this project. And so we're gonna call, I have your cards, we're gonna call you up, but I do believe there's been some com confusion over potentially prior agenda items or things in a city manager's report that led people to believe that there was action to be taken by council on this. That is not accurate. It's not on our agenda and we live by our agenda. So with that, I will start public comment. Um, Karen Rose. And, and you'll have three minutes. And if you'll just briefly introduce yourself and uh, make sure you're leaning into the microphone and that the green light is on. And, okay. So good evening. My name is Karen Rose. I'm president of and speaking on behalf of the Homeowners Association of Holland Court. Thank you for the opportunity to present the views and preferences of our community. And a special thank you to Mr. Ishri Shankar for the time he spent with the officers of our HOA to walk through the planned project for Chili Mill Road, which I know is not on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> it's apparent to me and my neighbors that this multi-use path project will have significant impact on our quality of life and our home values. Without the privacy and sound barrier provided by the trees and shrubs between our homes and Tilly Mill Road, we lose shade, quiet, and perceived safety. We gain exposure and noise and a 12-foot bicycle and pedestrian path that we neither need nor want. To our knowledge, the large neighborhoods, the JCC, the synagogue and college campus are not congesting Tilly Mill with pedestrians or bikers and therefore do not justify the need for this design change. Truthfully, with all of the foliage that will be destroyed to implement this change, who would want to walk or ride on this unshaded path? The summary noted there were 49 votes submitted to the city council in favor of placing this path on the east side of the road. Based on these 49 votes, the town is willing to spend 25% more money to construct an unneeded and unwanted multi-use path on the east side of Tilly Mill Road. Can you share from this data which side of the road those 49 votes came from? Apologies if the votes from the east side of the road were not submitted in a timely manner. However, I hope that does not negate the value of our feedback that's being given before the project is underway. Unfortunately, there were no written notifications to residents to review the plans and place a vote. Not all residents are proactively reading the Dunwoody website or Dunwoody News, and therefore leaving many uninformed about these planned changes until it's too late. My neighbors on the west side of Holland Court have experienced significant and repeated flooding to their homes because of a drain with insufficient depth that is constantly filled with pine straw and debris. Our understanding is that the plan for this path would include a remedy for this, and we on Holland Court appreciate that. The drainage issue, however, should have been addressed when the town was notified that this flooding was happening. It should happen regardless of this plan for the shared use path. It should happen now and without destroying the property impacted by the flooding. There are pieces of this plan that I'm sure we'd all appreciate. 
Those include the addition of pedestrian lighting, the suggested pedestrian refuge islands, and the redesign of the intersection of Tilly Mill and Mount Vernon Way. In summary, we on Holland Thank you, Ms. Rose. strongly object okay, to this project. Thank you. I cannot read this person's last name. It's Ralph from Stevens Walk. And if you'll just say your last name, please. <laughs> Sorry. My name is Ralph Amiel. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. um, my person who just spoke in front of me did a, a great, great speech about everything that was uh, that we thought was wrong. One of the things that I'm concerned about is the uh, taking out of the access and de-access lanes going into our subdivisions. Um, my subdivision is a senior subdivision. We have no kids. It's, I mean, it, it's sick. We have, I think probably the youngest we have is maybe 65 years old, and we have some 90 year olds in there. Of course, I'm 39. I'm one of the younger people. But the, the total elimination of this uh, of these access are, go, are going to really have a real problem for everybody. And I wanted you to be aware. I talked with the Ish Ishmai. I think it was is his name. Yeah, and he indicated to me this afternoon when I talked with him by phone that this was a done deal. And I'm just telling you what was said. And what concerns me a great deal that being a done deal without any representation of 49 people, I think is, 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 is a farce to be quite honest with you. That's all I have to say. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Brent Allen. My name is Brent Allen. I've lived in Dominey for 30 years. Uh, taxes should not be raised in this record inflationary period. Cities should be tightening their belt instead of adding to your wish list. We can't just go ask our employers or our retirement plans to give us a raise to cover this tax increase. My taxes, I know, have gone up, property taxes have gone up over 10% in the past two years. They're going to go up even more. Uh, the city should be focusing on needs and not wants, especially again in this highly inflationary period where we're all having to tighten our belts. We're asking the city to do the same. Uh, you say you're giving the citizens what they want, but that was, was that the case with the eminent domain of the church property that y'all claimed that y'all wanted, you know, we're doing that for the city residents, but then you found out that was not the case. We all know properties that have been turning over. I personally know of two properties uh, that sold last month that the residents had been in there since the early 2000s. Their basis in the properties, I know one was probably around 250. It just sold for 875. Another was less than 200. It just sold for 675. We're seeing properties like this all over Dunwoody turn over. City's revenue is going to increase because of those properties turning over and, and, and everything else is the increase in the commercial value. So your revenue is going to increase. You don't need to raise the millage rate to take another million dollars just to give the police a $250,000 raise. Because I, I, I bet a dollar to donuts, you aren't gonna reduce this millage at any time. Once it goes up, it's gonna stay up. So that would be my comment. This is the worst time to be raising taxes when we have record, uh, gasoline at record prices, inflation, uh, and this is just the wrong time to be doing this. And again, focus on the needs, not the wants. Tighten your belts, just like the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Long, Betty Long. Good evening, I'm Betty Long. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you. I have written letters. Um, I am a resident of Stevens Walk. I'm an original resident there. Um, I even walked the land with Bill Grant when it was planned. I've been a, a Dunwoody realtor now since 1985. And I sold a lot of homes in there. But I'm speaking as a resident that loves our community, really proud of the integrity of our community. 
I am very concerned about the traffic going in and out of our gates there. It's right now, it's, we do very well with two cars. We have two gates, a north gate and a south gate. So we do quite well with that. But any more than that, if, if we had our sidewalks taken away and larger sidewalks in there, to t it also will take more of our property. We have spent considerable money on our landscaping, which we think our, our neighborhood is an exemplary community for our, for our Dunwoody. And we're proud of that. That would take away, I counted this afternoon, 16 trees. And that's just on Stevens Walk's property. So we're very concerned about that. I am a walker on Tilly Mill. I rarely see a bicycle. I see people walking sometimes, but not a lot of paths. We also have a lot of traffic across the street with our Marcus Center. Then we're very proud of that. They're good neighbors, but it's a lot of traffic. We don't want the money spent. I agree with the gentleman that just talked about raising taxes and money. And we don't want to see anything happen to the integrity of our community. As a realtor, I know without a doubt that tearing this up, and I use that phrase, I know you would think maybe to enhance, but tearing up and causing a wider, wider sidewalks there to provide bike paths, and I rarely see a bike, that will not improve the, uh, our home's value. I think as senior citizens, and I'm certainly one among you, um, it will, I would not want to go into a community where I had to worry about getting in and out of my gate because of traffic, traffic and people walking. We're, we're thankful for what we have and we would very much like to keep it that way. But we also do not want to spend unnecessary tax dollars for this. And that's what I have to say. I appreciate everybody coming out and supporting this. And also our community of Stevens Walk has not really heard a lot about this in, prior to this coming out recently. So we would appreciate being informed as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Joe Thiessen, please correct me if I have. And just make sure you're speaking into the microphone and you'll have three minutes, sir. Okay, my name is Joe Thiessen. Uh, my wife, Charlotte, we've lived in Stevens Walk for 21 years. Uh, I kind of want to highlight a few major things, but then I want to touch on a subject. I don't know if some of the other people will. Uh, as far as a lot of concerns about Stevens Walk and the whole development, I think you can, as far as environmental concerns, you can talk about the shade. You can talk about the privacy in some of the houses it's going to have be devastating. Uh, as far as the overall look, it's going to make greatly change the overall look. It'll hugely affect the property values in some of these homes that are right next to uh, the Tilly Mill area. Uh, it, it, as far as the overall structure, I still have no idea why you guys came up with the east side where you destroy all these trees, where there's very few trees on the west side. It's beyond me how that would be picked. But I want to bring another subject, another thing that I don't, are, are there any bikers in this group? I mean, regular steady bikers. I guess they're not. But I am a regular biker, have for years. I mean, I bike miles. I go down Tilly Mill all the time. I go to Brook Run. I bike over, and I'm a walker too. And I go over there by, but these multi-path bicycle paths do not work well for bikers. I'll tell you why. Because if you do get, and I occasionally will go over to Brook Run or down by the Chattahoochee, if they're people or if they're dogs, it, it's hard to bike. You almost have to get off, even if there's no bike path. You have to get off. So they don't have a collision. So the idea that you're gonna make this for bikers, probably children to go bike and some inexperienced bikers, but all the regular bikers that flood Dunwoody on weekends, they will avoid that, avoid that just like I do. I go to Brook Run, unless there's no one around, I stay away. When I go down to Chattahoochee, I stay away. So that, if you're looking at accomplish this big bike thing for the multiple bikers, this 12 foot thing is not, not gonna do it. Um, as far as the, as far as the, like I said, I'm not supporting anything. I'm highly opposed to doing anything over there. But if you're only gonna take say 10 feet 
you could take maybe 10 feet, four foot for a bike path, four foot, four, four foot for a bike path at each side, forget that 12 foot, keep the existing sidewalk, four foot on one side, four foot on the other side, and expand the, the, the west side by about 12 foot. There's so many parts of that that already got two lanes. So you wouldn't need that many two lanes and you have to cut down very few trees. So you could preserve all the east side. You could create belt bike paths, which people will really use. Those are the bike paths. When you go out on weekends, there are bikers there. Most of them come on Womack and they go down Tilly Mill and they hit Brook Run. But if you're looking at, you could save the trees, you could have a bike path, just widen that west side where it needs to be. Where they, got, where they got roads, you don't have to do anything. Only a few areas, cut down minimal trees and save the whole east side. I've seen what it looks like at Chapel Hill. It looks like expressway. You get those things, I just drove up there again today. It looks like expressway. It'll really totally ruin the look of Tilly Mill. So I hope you give this a lot of thought. I hope we have more meetings so we have a chance to get a lot more Thank input you, sir. on this. Thank you. Charlotte? Charlotte Tyson, Joe's wife. Uh, I also live at Tilly Mill. I have, first I have one question. Has the mayor, have you ever looked at the impact that this will have on Tilly Mill? Under Georgia law, this is a one-way discussion. Oh, all so, right. I'm sorry. All right, well, that would be my question. The other thing seems to be that trees have absolutely no value in the city of Dunwoody at all. It's what, what it, it, you can take trees down for anything you want here. My personal opinion is, being that we live across from the JCC and we have to go out there, that is going to cause massive, massive congestion. They take buses out of there. They have buses out of there at least twice a day. They are school buses, they are camp buses, and we are not going to be able to get onto our street until all that is done. And the other thing is, if you look at the way Dunwoody has proceeded, which I think very seriously is a is close to a crime, is you can't just put up one stoplight. You have big black uh, metal bars and they have big things overhead and you don't have one stoplight for each. You have at least six. Every lane has to have. What we've done to the city of Dunwoody, I think is atrocious. I don't know how any of that got through. I really don't. We've, we've just made us, uh, you can go to any other, you can go to any other large city and they don't need that kind of a thing for stoplights. The other thing is that the, uh, we will probably have to control our exit from our development because if the buses are coming through and they're at JCC, which seems to be getting, uh, I don't quite understand the preference that's been done here at all. Uh, I suspect there's a lot of input on it. I suspect there's a lot of taxes paid by that development. But my, my personal opinion, we're gonna to have to wait. Don't just say, buses are exiting three to 3.30. So we don't get to go. Now, I don't think that's correct to do to any of us. And I hope that you will really, really give this some thought. And if you haven't visited the area, please take a look at it. You don't need all of that. This is a beautiful area. Our, it, it isn't just our development, it's the whole area for walking and, and everything else there. And we haven't had any problems and we work well with the way JCC is now. We do work well with those people, but this something is just not been done right here. And I really hope that, I would hope that the city council people would at least look at it and see what the impact is going to be. And like the others, I don't understand why the west side is not being touched. There's only one reason it's probably not being touched. And I do think it's the development over there with JCC. And they don't even have to take down a lot of trees if you went over there. Thank you, Thank you. for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Leonid Kutubov, I'm totally messing up your name, I apologize. It's, he's coming. Right. Just introduce yourself, please, and you'll have three minutes. Make sure you speak into the mic. Yeah, I need to go for a leaf and uh, Stephen spoke as well. And I'm against whatever press 
you guys maybe will put on, not only on east or on west side. I sent the mail and got um, a reply at least. I know answer from Mr. Seconder that no any research was done. So my question, how many bikers really somebody envisioned to use? Okay. How much it will cost them? Do you have master plan to put this 12 feet pass to every street in Dunwoody? And in this case, how much it will cost? Now. About raising our millage, I really would like to see it be decreased, or maybe I will live long enough to see it. But if you guys will put this kind of project, especially on every street in Dunwoody, I guess it will be a dream which never will come through. I'm really surprised with you guys without explanation. I, really curious who put this idea through, you know, how it basically was burned, okay? Now, I could address something else, okay? Because I want city money to be spent well. About two years ago, we did renovation in our house and big problem was to get inspection, you know, inspector come in whatever agreeable time. We have contractors sitting on our driveway for more than half day waiting, okay? And all my effort, which I did talking with chief of department and everybody else really did not bring any results. So if you really want to do something good, you know, look inside how done with department's work and make it work better. I'm done. Carrie Smith, and you'll have three minutes. Please make sure the light is on and speak into the microphone. Um, I'm Carrie Smith and I live in Dunwoody. I've lived here for about 20 years. And I'm um, talking about the property tax values I'm in real estate. And my property value itself went up $200,000 in the last year. So you're gonna get increase in taxes anyway because they've increased our assessed value. So even without any millage rate increase, you're gonna get a huge increase in value. And I also wanna say that my property taxes for the past probably five years have been more than my um, mortgage, what I'm paying on my house. So my taxes are over that, if that makes sense. How when you pay your, you know, your mortgage company, half of it's taxes and the rest goes towards your payment. So I'm sorry, when my, and we just live in a modest house, you know, it's not a million dollar house. And so I just think that the taxes are too high and you don't need to raise the rates because you're hurting people and especially older people who are on fixed incomes. You know, I don't know why you'd want to hurt your you know, neighbors by doing that. And what else? And with gas prices doubling, food has doubled, inflation with all the money they've printed, I just think that you're hurting, you know, regular working people. And I can't go to my boss and say, well, hey, my property taxes increased by $4,000. I need a $4,000 raise. But you guys don't ask us if we can afford that, do you? You know, you need to think about that. And this is, you know, they're talking about you cutting down these trees, but you cut down over a hundred trees on Chambly Dunwoody to, to, to build all those sidewalks, which there were already sidewalks there. And when I came back from out of town and saw that, I almost started crying because, because I don't know why you don't care about stuff like that. Thanks. David Harold. Sharon, how much do we have time? Okay, that's fine. This is the last card. That's fine. Save it for the public. Good evening. I'm David Harold, live in Stevens Wharf. Mm -hmm. My wife and I have been there for 21 years. Uh, I've seen quite a few changes in Tilly Mill Road. Unfortunately, most of them not for the better. Uh, traffic has built up ridiculously. Uh, the 
college that was originally a small <clears throat> community college, uh, three, four, whatever number of thousands of people has grown to about 30,000. Uh, you got traffic jams in the afternoon when schools are in session. <clears throat> One of the byproducts of the pandemic is that it's relieved some of the traffic. But when the pandemic is over, uh, we're back to dealing with that. The traffic light up at Mount Vernon and Tilly Mill on a left turn signal in the afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, is atrocious. Uh, you must wait six, seven, eight cycles to try to make a left turn to go home. Uh, of all these things that are troubling our area, the last thing in the world I expected to hear when I came back from vacation was, guess what, we need a bike path. Uh, during the pandemic, we've walked quite a bit up and down Tilly Mill and didn't run into that many people and certainly didn't run into a, hordes of bikes that had no place to go. So if this is really the first and foremost need, I am just totally puzzled. I don't know where that came from. I don't know what that'll accomplish. And as some of the people here have alluded to, when the vote goes through for becoming a city, there are two sides uh, that fight it out. One explains what will happen to you if you become a city, and the other one puts fear into you about what will happen to you if you don't become a city. Well, this project makes the former group right. You create a city and you dream of projects. And where is the need? Where is the desire? Where is the improvement? And especially, how does that improvement, if it is one, rank order in terms of all the other improvements that we should be talking about. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes this section of public uh, comment and we will have another section at the end of the meeting should you have more to say. Um, next up is our city manager's report. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna go through the report which starts with the police department. Uh, the police department Teen Police Academy will be held, it's actually this week, it started today, and it's held all week. Um, also, our officers are continuing to work on distracted driving detail to make done a little bit safer on the roads. We issued about 15 citations for hands-free violations along Ashford Dunwoody Road in the, in the, since the last report. We also are working still uh, very closely with our license plate reader system. And as you read through the report, you'll see how that we had, a, we had a wanted person we picked up through that, several wanted people, stolen license plates, things of that nature through those cameras. It really helps our overall system for safety and within the city. The report does go for about six pages of Hi. police. Excuse, I'm sorry, we have to, by law, continue with our meeting. So if everyone could just exit quietly, please. Thank you, Mayor. Anybody continue on? Okay. All yes, right. So um, if you, when you read through that, you'll see other different kind of uh, traffic stops and other items that our officers deal with on a daily basis. In public works, um, we advertised for requests for qualifications for the jet ferry concepts. Also our happy hollow sidewalk. Uh, the Spalding at Shanley Dunwoody intersection, construction 57, paved that at the, the last week of June. And the remaining task out there is the culvert near the city limit line at the bottom of the hill. And that will be done later this month through Astra Construction. The Georgetown Gateway, we've completed 350 feet of path north of the Kent Avenue. And we're still working on some relocations of utilities there. Uh, Winter's Chapel Trail phase one, the stormwater pipe was installed along Fountain Blue, uh, that, that portion uh, south of there. Also the Shanley Dunwoody at Womack intersection continues to work on uh, utility relocation. The uh, Blount construction paving, we've been, we paved this year so far in uh, Beaver Brook, uh, Braddock, Mill Glen, and Withmire neighborhoods. And in July, we're gonna uh, continue paving on Dunwoody Club Forest, Meadow Creek Estates, Trotter Cove, and Mount Vernon Lake. Also the contract to replace the section on Redfield Drive and pipelining is scheduled uh, for week of, this week, July 11th. Under parks, um, there's a, many upcoming events between the July 1st and uh, 
September 31st, including we had a rescheduled grooving on the green or one of the grooving on the greens because of the weather last week. Um, let's see here, workload activity under that uh, area was during the 4th of July parade last Monday. Um, the crews did a lot of work to prepare for the parade along the landscaping, along the uh, parade route. Under uh, community development, High Street development is continuing its build out with a mixed use. Here again, and y'all heard me say it before, if you have not driven by there, please do. It is a constantly changing landscape in that area. Um, the permitting for Campus 244 project continues, which is re rehabbing the current office building and also the construction of a hotel and parking deck. The permitting for 11 Ravinia Drive project continues which is a new 110,000 square foot retail facility. And then also uh, the North Italia and PF Chang's restaurant are nearing completion. And the Buffalo Wild Wing is progressing and has begun the foundation on that building. The department completed 651 building inspections last month and the staff issued 72 code enforcement warnings, five citations and three stop work orders, along with bringing 52, 52 cases into compliance. Um, let me move on through the report, a few pages. Um, under communications, we're unveiling the new economic development microsite. So if you'll log in and check on that. There's also the summer Dumbledore Digest was delivered to 23,490 residents and businesses um, on its last issue. And there's a link within your document that goes to the Dumbledore Digest and also several links within the communication portion. Uh, speaking of links, also the monthly financial report for May can be found within this document. And then we, um, one of the major issues in finance that we had completed was the invitation to bid 2207, which was the notice of intent to sell our property at 4553 and 4555 North Shallifer Road. And that opened on June 17th and the awarding bid or the high bid, I should say, y'all have to still conclude the um, process on that process being to vote on it officially, which is the Summit Health Care Group was a sole bidder for $7.78 million to sell that, that property. Um, finance submitted their annual financial report to the Georgia Department of Audits and Accounting as required by state law. And also the department submitted the annual reporting requirements to the Georgia Department of Community Affairs as well. Uh, finance will continue to work with human resources on the payroll, on our new payroll um, software. The also the um, under municipal court, the department had 793 cases last month and reset 59 of those cases. We still work very closely with anybody who needs to reset their case based on COVID or any other issues they may have. Our courts are very friendly court from the standpoint of working with people. We do move a lot of cases through that court. Um, we also are having our amnesty program uh, for July, or for this month actually, and which is July of course, and then we've mailed over 400 letters for two people for the for amnesty, and that's an excellent program. Uh, anybody who's had a ticket or may have a warrant issued against them can be very inconvenient if you're stopped by another jurisdiction with a warrant. This is a chance to clear those items up at no additional fees. Just come in and pay your fee, and we will... Um, get the paperwork squared away. The department also reappointed judges and two new judges took the oath of office at our last meeting. Human resources and the wellness committee are planning a biometric screening, flu shots and angio screens for employees. This will be happening in the late summer or early fall of this year. Um, and the city has filled seven positions since the last report, four police officers, one a county manager, one human resource general generalist, and one records clerk since the last report. So it's a very active um, staff that we have and Mayor, it's our pleasure to always serve with y'all and I'm glad to answer any questions you may have. Was there anything about Tilly Mill and the path on that report? And is it possible that someone perhaps misunderstood something a city employee said about things being a done deal? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Cause it all goes through the public process there's nothing is a done deal until it's a uh, final construction and voted and on time. by council, correct? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, most of our guests left. Um, anybody else have anything? Okay, Stacey. Um, 
And my apologies that I don't know this. I didn't look at the document. What Jet Ferry concept are we looking at? <laughs> and let me let me pull that back up. The um... Because it just says qualifications for jet ferry concepts, right, and I honestly right. just didn't know, and I didn't right. ask so, Michael. So what we have there is, and actually, I'm gonna get Michael Smith to come up. I think he's he's on his way down right now to talk about that. The um, this is a this is a part of the project. I think it's a joint project, some with Sandy Springs in that area as that well. Right, okay. it's at the intersection, and um, and so that's that's what it is. How we want to redo the intersection there, if of jet ferry and uh, club or the triangle or both. I believe it's on both both sections okay. where we're going to look right there, and then let's see. But he will be on his, yeah, yeah, he, he's okay. on his way down because I'd love for him to give more information on that. It's a great question, and I'll be glad to answer. I know that and then my other question for be for ah, oh, here he comes, man okay. of the hour, minute. <laughs> Michael, we're talking about the jet ferry concepts the way we advertise for for qualifications. Yes, that's a uh, study in the budget that's uh, basically looking at a streetscape for Jet Ferry. This would just be a concept plan, you know, what. So that would, so the streetscape would just be from Dunwoody Club because we only own it from Dunwoody Club up to Mount right, Vernon. Right. Okay. So not necessarily an intersection improvement or just a streetscape or all of it? Just, just a streetscape. Just street. Okay. How, Thank you. You know, how wide the buffers and sidewalks you know, if there's room, mainly trying to work within the existing right of way to see how we could create a, a streetscape. Okay. And then my next question actually for you was with the, um, the Spalding intersection, I actually just drove over it about a half hour ago. That is a very large bump, like uneven pavement. And I know it says pavement is going to continue. Are we going to soften that bump at all? Or is that part of the, like the punch list item? at the south end going, south going end, down correct. the hill south end uh, we can we can there the paving will continue once we're done with the pipe work but we can smooth that out a little bit in the short term i was just kind of surprised um, maybe it was just my car but i was like whoa that was kind of a big bump and for us to be that complete it kind of surprised me that was that rough yeah yeah it, it, when the pipe's done it'll the paving will continue all the way to the yeah. city line okay thank you uh, Catherine, did you have questions? Uh, just a parks question because they mentioned that uh, I went to D you DEI programming and I'd love for everyone to hear what is covered there and what you anticipate coming out of that greater and greener conference. Um, unfortunately, I had COVID while I was there. So um, my staff did attend and it's an urban uh, park conference. Uh, it was in Philadelphia, so we did. Uh, I was able to go on some tours prior to being quarantined, but it was primarily talking about mixing of urban spaces and park design. Uh, we met with a lot of landscape architects around the Philadelphia Mall area um, and just talked about integrating existing communities uh, and pathways to connect um, those communities in existing urban settings or were some of the classes I got to go to. Okay, I'm sorry that you were sick. Um, and I'm excited about the speed bumps being reduced. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Rob, Tom. And I am remiss in that I did not mention, and I apologize, that two of our council members are missing tonight because they have personal family emergencies. In fact, Councilman Seconder's mother-in-law passed away. And so that is why we are short two council people. So... I apologize, I should have announced that. At the beginning, please keep the seconders in your thoughts and prayers. Okay, Mr. Vinicky, I think you're up. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this is a public hearing on the millage rate. And as I get set up, I'd like to give a little bit of context before we actually start. Sure, I got it up and on there. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, one thing that I'd like for the general public to be aware of is that over the past three years or so, the city council has, and then all of a sudden somebody's taken over my screen. <laughs> um, the city council has started a process of financial planning as it gets into the adolescent stage of cityhood. In the first few years, it's let's get things up and running. Let's do the, 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 the low hanging fruit. Let's improve what we really need. Uh, I do applaud the council on taking some steps. And um, in some odd ways, the COVID financial crisis also exacerbated and created a planning process that I'm glad this, the city council has embraced. And part of it has led to this. Uh, what happened was about three years ago, we started looking at the fact that there wasn't really a capital plan for the city. Did we have plans sitting on the shelf? Yes. Did we have things that we knew we wanted or needed built? Yes, but we didn't have what was a funded plan. So the first thing the council did was look at what could be funded within realistic budgets and budgeted for that. And you adopted it two years ago and you've modified it twice then. And you'll modify it again this fall through the annual budget process. Tied to that and at the retreat this year, you started doing an operating forecast. Now in the past, previous staff had said at some point, revenues are going to be outpaced by expenditures. And during this presentation, I'm gonna show a lot about how we have a lot of revenue sources that are frozen, not just residential taxes that have been frozen, but other sources of revenue that are not stable for growth. So what the council started doing presented at the retreat was show that the next five years and making some what I will agree conservative assumptions on revenue and realistic expenditures that our fund balance would dip below normal levels within the next five years. With that, we started looking at alternative scenarios and that's what you're seeing before you tonight. The council is nominally raising the 2.74 millage rate to 3.04, which is the cap allowed under the city charter written by the city founders. In other words, it was put in black and white. You can't go above this, but this is an acceptable level. So that's what will be voted on tonight. And that brings us to our presentation here. Okay, first off the nitty gritty. State law requires three of these public hearings. Now, whether the city would have had a millage rate increase or not had a millage rate increase, we would have had three public hearings on it. And this is the third of it. On top of that, there were three additional town halls which discussed this prop. Pro this process. We also had, if I, I've counted right, three additional council meetings during that time. So all in total, we've had nine different areas where people can comment, give feedback to it. Um, I've seen emails forwarded from citizens to council members to me back and forth. And there's been plenty of input. In fact, I think I, I can applaud the city for being as transparent as it could be on this process. And again, this is the third of required hearing, whether or not we did 3.04 or 2.74, all three would be required. To give just, and I always like to kind of help out the media when they're reporting things. When we're talking about this tax increase, let's look at two different types of homes. The first one is the brand new purchased $500,000 home. That person would have their taxes go from $321 to $378 a year. That would be the increase for a half million dollar home, $57 a year. For most homes though that are 500,000, their price has actually been frozen. One of the things that gets stated quite frequently during hearings is my bill went up. Your typical bill for a homeowner here, and I'm not gonna say which one of you five I pulled your bill from while I was sitting in the front row, but I pulled one of your fives bill, has a bill of about $5,100 on their home. However, their taxes for the city were frozen and have been since 2009. That amount of that bill is $251. There is no citizen of Dunwoody in a homesteaded property that has ever seen a tax increase in any year since incorporation. If you were paying $251 in 2008, you are paying $251 today. The city also founders also put in a freeze on homesteaded properties. The amount you were taxed in the first year you bought your home is the amount you are still taxed today even though healthcare has gone up for police officers. We're now in a competitive pay environment for that. There's additional things along the lines of just normal resurfacing and maintenance work on roads where there's inflationary costs. But no resident in Dunwoody's history has ever seen a tax increase. And in this one, it's a small one at that. The house that's 500,000 that we're going to call frozen at 375, the increase for that family would be $42 a year under this proposal. The most obvious question though, 
the city's financial and healthy, which Linda Neighbor is the finance director is back there. Her and I both will say, we can say we are financially healthy. However, COVID taught us how fragile that our revenue and our expenses are in the relation. We did have one revenue source that literally collapsed for a brief period of time during COVID, and that was our hotel motel tax. Looking at about one, one and a half annually from it, there was a month it dropped to what I would say is the lowest I've ever seen hotel and motel tax in this city. Now it has rebounded. The hotels are coming back. However, we need to make sure because even with today's upticks in numbers, we're always afraid there could be another drastic drop. So we still have to project conservatively. So it goes back to the question, why this tax increase? It's because when the city council started looking at the operating millage rate and looking at the future and knowing things that we're going to open up in the near future, we have Austin, we have Vermont, we also have Brook Run, which has started to do more programming. We also have a very competitive police officer environment with compensation now, which we'll also address later in this agenda. Things like that have to be addressed with revenue. The current revenues we have in the, in the forecast that we do will not cover this potential increase expenditures over the year. Again, it's saying let's go to the cap, which was instituted by the city founders. It's, it's here's the limit, unless you take it to the voters for an additional case. So in this case, we started looking at the forecast and realized over the short term, this can definitely help us for at least the next three years, if not for four or five more. Now, this is a chart I'd like to go through, and I want to go through a little bit of extra information on this for everybody. What you have here is three separate budgets. The budget on the left is the general fund budget. It was passed by council last fall, starts January 1st. The middle budget is what it would be at 2.74 mils, the current rate. And the third is at 3.04 mils, the cap. Now let's go top to bottom to explain everybody what's going on here. The starting balance at the beginning is 22.5 million. That is the amount I like to say, and I have a finance director who will tell me not to say it's cash in the bank because it is not but it is the amount of available funding to run the city. It is not a good practice to use this money to run the city. You should at minimum keep four months in there. Currently we're floating between seven and eight. When COVID happened, city council agreed that we would start looking at that at a more conservative basis because we didn't know what would happen at revenues. We started looking at forecasting using some of that for one-time expenditures. For instance, later on in the agenda, we're going to look at a modification to the amount, not to the amount that we're giving, but the amount for Spruill and the um, Dunwoody Nature Center will come from this fund balance. It's acceptable to do that as a one-time purchase. However, it's not a good practice to run the city on your fund balance. So we started looking at the bottom number here, the one that's labeled structural deficit. When it was passed in last October, the budgeted structural deficit, meaning ongoing revenues and ongoing expenditures, there was a gap of almost $4 million. We knew this going into it. We also knew we were projecting incredibly conservative revenues because we're still at that point, not even a full two years into COVID. We weren't sure to go. We now have better revenue numbers. And when we started to look at that, you see the middle one. The middle one made that structural deficit 2.2 million. We had an uptick in other revenues that we get. We also have a higher bit of expenses because of the one time for Dunwoody Nature Center and the Art Center. However, the structural deficit is down to 2.2 million. This millage increase will increase total revenues by about a million more. So that's what you see in the third column. The structural deficit will be basically 1.1 to 1.2 million. That's what this action does. It helps us with that. It makes ongoing revenues and ongoing expenditures tied to the same thing. Now, some things I'd also like to bring up about revenue sources that don't get discussed much is that we don't really have a lot of revenue sources that just increase. We've already talked about the fact that no homeowner here has ever seen a city tax increase, and we're going to look at that bill on the next slide. But nobody, in the, uh, with the day you buy your house, your first taxes you pay are the same taxes you pay every year unless the council adjusts it. The assessors cannot adjust your city taxes upwards. It's actually forbidden in the city code. Let's talk about some of the other taxes that we have out there. For instance, the business license, 2.2 million or so. Business license is one of those things that does not necessarily go up every year. Another one we like to look at is the intangible recording tax, which is one of those $3.7 million, $3 million items that basically flatlines. It stays the same. 
We look at building permits. Now, building permits went up during COVID, but it was ironic in the way they went up. It went up for people putting decks on the back of their houses. It went up on the small ticket items. We also do have some other large projects such as High Street, which have done that. However, Richard McLeod and I have done a deep dive into the way that our building permits come up. For big projects, they're a boom that first year, okay? The building permits shoot up, but it doesn't bring a long-term. Now, does the commercial property increase in value? Yes, it does. But remember that our digest also depends upon residential and residential does not necessarily go up unless those properties sell. Let me talk another thing about the 2.74 millage rate that gets lost in the shuffle. In your packages tonight and in the published agenda online, it's an it's a ugly looking schedule, so I haven't put it on the screen. But it's one of the things that I do love, one of my former coworkers in the tax commissioner's office does every year. And that's published the combined rates for every city in DeKalb. Now, it's hard for us to compare ourselves to some of our sister cities. They don't do the same services. And I'll give one for instance. Tucker uses the police department for DeKalb. So you have to look at the county tax rate to their rate to compare ours. So what the tax commissioner does is it says, the tax commissioner Urban just says, I'm gonna add everybody's taxes. We are the nominally lowest jurisdiction when you add in city, county, and school. We come in at 38.784. The city is only 2.74 of that 38.784 only 5% of your total tax bill comes to this city. The second lowest is Brookhaven at 39.354. If the city raises its 2.74 to the cap, it would still be the lowest in the cap. This is a raise which does not even move the city's amount above the lowest. So it's a very small move. Now, is it a move the city needs to make? Yes, but it is an incredibly small move. This is the forecast we were talking about earlier. And this is something that I, I definitely applaud all of y'all for taking interest. Everybody has sat down and gotten a 101 on how to look at lines. For the public, basically revenue needs to be above expenditures, black above red. It's not in this forecast, but I'm also going to say that the black line revenue is done in a very conservative fashion. We purposely do the growth at two or 3% a year with expenses going up about three or 4% a year. That means that green should be above blue. Green is the required fund balance, the amount that we should have at the end of the year. Blue, excuse me, blue is what we should have. Green is what we have. Notice that in this one, it crosses at 2025 below the four month. Uh, uh, Linda Neighbors and I feel pretty safe that being the first time the city has gotten into this process and as conservative as we're doing revenue, three years is where we want to manage. The next one you see, and hopefully the one in the budget process for 2023 will have us out to five years and be able to work with this. But what you're doing is you're passing a budget today. You're passing a millage rate today that is to help you do raises in the future for police officers, to help you keep the health care cost up, to understand that when you do build a jewel like Brook Run, you do have to maintain it. And it's not an easy thing to maintain. So for this is why we're looking at this increase. Now let's go back to impact on this. This is back to typical homes. And I like to use these six of Dunwoody, a 400, $600,000 house, and also a 400, dollars $600,000 house that was frozen. Those are the top three at 300, 375, and 450. These homes are paying between $181 and $390 a year. And I'm being very specific, a year. Some of them are just having a little bit over a dollar a day to have full police services, to have full public work services, to have a full park system. And I don't mean this in a sarcastic fashion, but a lot of these same homes, homeowner dues, blow this out of the water. What you get from the city for what we do is incredibly well done. And I applaud staff for managing the way that they have. Even with this tax increase, it's only going to go from a range of $214 to $459 a year. And that $459 would be for a family in a $600,000 house that they purchased yesterday. They would be paying $459 in city taxes. That same people's tax bill for all combined might be about $7,000, but the city will receive less than $500 for it, for again, providing police parks and public works. This is your bill. This is a typical bill and I'm not gonna say which one of you five it is, 
but it's one of your five's actual bill. The gray area is where most of it goes, school system. You're looking, and, and I do two different versions because the way the county does this e-host, I want to be factually accurate. So you have to look at it two ways. But the schools are between 60 and 75% of your bill. Notice that the city amount, city taxes, four to 5%. Even with moving from 2.74 to 3.04, the needle will not move with this. It is a very minor move to a cap instituted in the original city charter as the maximum allowed without looking at the voters. It was authorized, the city council should look at. You have looked at it, you've planned for the future, and that's what you're running with today. I'd like to go through the digest itself. This is the wonderful, this is, this is about eight or $9 million of our revenue here. It goes up mostly, there are some years it goes down. It's very surprising, but it does. And this is one of the things that we have to maintain. Now, this is what makes budgeting a small city problematic. Margin of error is a little bit different. We don't want to have to come back at mid-year and cut so even though we might think three or 4% growth, we budgeted about 2% growth and it came in at 6% this year. It's good. I can't guarantee that for next year though. I am fearful and I will say this on record that the valuation of commercial properties is still very suspect. A lot of it has to do with whether or not they can rent the space out. And we are still in an economy where we are unsure if office space will be rented. And if they go to the tax assessor, and say my property is worth less today than it was two years ago because I cannot fill it. So we still will have to be cautious in the next two and three and four years on this. Same graph except showing year over year change. If it goes up, it's a good year. If it goes down, it's a bad year. 13 years of Dunwoody history, we've had three down years. Now there are various reasons behind each one. The Great Recession, uh, the court case is what happened to the most recent one. But this is one of the things. We don't have a revenue source that is a guaranteed growth. The ones we mentioned earlier, all are slow. I'm not saying they're, I'm not saying they're bad. They're what typical cities are. But that's why we looked at 2.74 versus 3.04. This is showing the, the disparity between, uh, between commercial and residential. And this is something that one of the gentlemen at the original public hearing this morning talked about, is that we do have a freeze on residential property. It was put in by the voters it might be the time to look at it differently. Um, the cities in North Fulton, which all started putting this in about three years ago, actually indexed theirs to inflation. Ours is not indexed to anything. It is frozen and it stays frozen. The counties is the same way. The school does not have this freeze. If your house went from 500 to 600,000, the school system is the one that makes off with the money. The city, and I'll even say the county, doesn't make off with any more off of this. So what's the main goal? Main goal of raising the millage rate to the statutory cap is to make sure that ongoing revenues and ongoing expenditures in both short and long term start to meet. It's the first step to do in this process. With new parks on the horizon and residential tax bills frozen, this is the only arrow in the quiver that can be used at the council level. And it was created by the city's founders to say, look, this is the most you can go. So this would be it. And the vote today would be for this rate. Projections show that raising to the cap right now we do know that we can manage through 2025 and possibly six and seven without adjusting it more. And this would be with all the assumptions that we've put into the expenditure growth, looking at new parks that possibly can open, rebidding of city contracts. We have inflation built in there. And we also have a new pay system that we've put in. Those are all part of the concept of looking at this in a holistic manner. And with that, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. I will open the public hearing unless there's an objection. Seeing none, the public hearing is open. We will have 10 minutes for each side. Um, if you will start with against, if you are against this proposed uh, tax increase, military rate increase, please um, come forward. One second, let's let Jay go. Ginger, can you stop sharing the screen? The mouse has died. Hold on. I don't know, did Ginger hear you? One second. Yeah, she does. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that, we will have 10 minutes against and then 10 minutes for. Um, if you'll just introduce yourself, there's no cards for this. Sure. My name is Brent Allen. Again, I've lived in the city for 30 years. Um, you say there's transparency in all this, but out of this million dollars, we only the only thing that I know is 250000 or so for police uh, raise. Where the rest of it's going, I don't know. Again, the city has a spending problem. You are spending, you know, deficit. You're still at a deficit. 
you need to tighten your belt and not just turn around and raise more money. You're going to be like a kid with a credit card. You get a new spending limit and you're just going to keep spending. And to, to say that, compare us to other cities and say, oh, well, look at the other cities around and we're lower. This is exactly what colleges did when they started building new dorms, building new locker rooms, building new living areas, all these fancy water parks and everything else to compete, supposedly to have to compete to get all these college students to come to them. And what happened? College tuition has gone through the roof. So y'all need to recognize y'all have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. And you need to postpone this vote till next year till you see what are these properties that are turning over at record record values is going to do to your revenue stream because i have a feeling it's going to shoot it way up so you don't need to take another million dollars from the residents so again we don't have a way to go to our either our pension plans or our retirement systems to our bosses and say we need a pay increase because the city just raised the money and no matter how much you say well this is the only, this is what the the city doesn't get an increase to the residents we've all seen our property taxes go up significantly. I'm sorry the city's not getting a lot of that. Y'all should know that, but you shouldn't be raising taxes because I know my property taxes are gonna shoot through the roof. So unless you just want everybody to, you know, especially all the, the, the senior people to just move out of the city, then go ahead and raise taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against this? Just uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Nancy Nicodemus, mm -hmm. been in Dunwoody since 1974, homeowner since 1995. And to kind of echo what Mr. Brett just said, when I read the article that announced what we were considering, it appears to me that we, the trouble in Dunwoody with a capital T, back to that old song, rhymes with P, and in this case, our, we cannot afford our appetite for parks. So it says that if we looked at our original budget and compared to where it's indexed now, our parks budget has gone up by a factor of seven times. So if you ask anyone, a kid or an adult, do you want more cheese on the pizza? They will always say yes, until you tell them there's a limit. And the limit is how much is in mom or dad's wallet. And you only have a hundred chips, that's a hundred percent of your budget, and it needs to equal what the revenue is. So I, I think we've convinced ourselves to quote John Hennigan here in this article, the quote service expectations of our residents and businesses is that we want all these parks and we clearly can't afford them because it's driving a lot of our expenses. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, Sharon, do we have time? I'm sure we have time remaining. Anyone else? All right, we will move to the, oh. Okay, you have to introduce yourself and speak into the microphone, please. I will, thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. And um, thank you for everyone for your input. Uh, my name is Joan Griffin. I've lived in Dunwoody since 1980 when it was Doraville. <laughs> and uh, so I think, I think everyone's got good intentions. And I, I, but I think there's a lack of serious planning. I oppose the tax increase because, you know, you can parse numbers, you can parse words, but the fact is the money comes out of someone's pocket. And as our tax rates go up, we were told when the city was incorporated that there would be no additional costs. We all knew that was kind of a joke, but we were like, all right, whatever you guys want to do, we can't vote it down. If you're not getting enough money from DeKalb County, we're doing heavy lifting here in, in Dunwoody. You should go back to DeKalb County and renegotiate deal, not put the squeeze on us as we're carrying the load. A source of revenue that I don't think was mentioned, and I'm not an accountant, is the uh, fact that we're in a very inflationary period. If we all want to agree that it's just 8%, I'll say, okay, yeah, it's just 8%. All my expenses only went up 8%. Uh, during that time, uh, my fixed income wasn't fixed because my IRA and my 401k plummeted. So here we go. We've got 8% increase on all the services and goods that we buy. We go to the grocery store, we have at least an 8% increase. 
So that means sales tax are going up 8%, right? Revenue from sales tax goes up because when you're there at Kroger, they don't say, hey, man, milk went up, but we're not going to charge you the sales tax. So I don't know how much comes from the sales tax, but that's a steady increase that government benefits by because of the inflationary rate that we're all experiencing. You know, you're experiencing it and I'm experiencing it. It's not like me against you. Uh, so, you know, I'm not seeing significant improvements in the quality of life. I agree that the, the trees have been torn down. You know, some of these uh, traffic control circles, maybe they help, maybe just uh, encouraging people to treat each other like a neighbor and not drive through someone else's neighborhood like their Mario Andretti would help. Um, I appreciate all the work that you put into the reporting and, and trying to make it understandable to us, but it still comes down to, you know, money out of the pocket. And so does the money go to some process that I, I don't agree to? Or does the money go into the collection for the kids that don't have school bags? Or does it go to the um, animal control to help feed the dogs? Or does it go you know, to Boys Town to help some kids? So there's only so much money and you have to live within your budget. You, know, you can't throw a tantrum and uh, expect that you'll embarrass us and extort the funds out of us. Uh, you, you, you pointed to a one-time cost with the Nature Center but you want to lock in to a permanent increase in the millage rate. You know, you underreported revenue and you didn't even tap into that 22 number on the top. If you tapped into that 22 number on the top, there'd be nothing in parentheses on the bottom. And uh, so I, I do want to thank you. I know you guys work hard. I don't want to be, you know, negative person. I'm just saying that I think we can do better. And I think it's time for Dunwoody to go back to the cab County and say, we're doing the heavy lifting, fork over some coins. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't know how much time is left. Does anybody else want to speak against? If not, we will move to four. Um, if you are here to speak in support of a tax increase or fall that way, uh, approach the uh, mic and you'll, we'll have 10 minutes for that side. All right, my name is Hazel Seagull. I've lived here in Dunwoody since I'm a homeowner in 94, just live a mile away. <clears throat> I, I, like anyone else, don't like taxes being raised. However, I do like what the city council has done with the money. I have been privy to see what parks and recreation, how hard they work and what they've done. I'm a member of um, Chattahoochee Handweavers Guild, which is just a small, um, nonprofit here in Dunwoody, but I know that Parks and Recreation has enhanced my life and has made Dunwoody a better place for um, visitors to come to. The same thing when people talk about Spruill, they talk about Spruill no matter where you're in the city of Atlanta, and it's because the city of Dunwoody has given Parks and Recreation the funding to do that, and I do appreciate it. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Hazel. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in support of the military? My name is Sue Ellis and I have lived in Dunwoody for about 35 years. I would like to urge you to vote in favor of this millage rate increase tonight. Um, I do believe you have to pay to play. And I enjoy all the amenities in Dunwoody. Um, the city, since we became a city, has put them online and increase their value to the community in, in, enormously. I enjoy it all and I believe I need to pay to play. So I encourage you to vote to increase the millage rate. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? At this time, I'll close the public hearing and I've never done this before. So what do I do now, Sharon? <laughs> I wait for Lynn. That's what I do. Discussion. No, discussion I do. And okay, questions of staff. Okay. So while Lynn comes back up, I do have one um, quick question. I'll ask Jay. Somebody had asked about um, the sales tax. Jay, how much money does uh, the city of Denver get from uh, sales tax? Uh, we're, I'm, are we at a 7 million mark now? 7 million or so annually. The one thing about sales tax, and this is a weird Georgia law, we can't use it to run the city. Sales tax can only be used to build things. It can't be used to pay anybody's salary. 
It can't be used to pay for police officer salary. So unfortunately, that's a state law that even though we did it, we dedicate a great deal of it, the vast majority of transportation usage and repaving. But we can't, I, 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 I'm forbidden from using that from paying anybody on staff salary. Okay. Anybody else? Tom? Tom? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to uh, just begin by thanking you, Jay, Linda, and Richard. I know that a tremendous amount of work has gone into this. It hasn't been a, a short or easy process. <laughs> um, and uh, you've done a very good job of not only presenting information to the council that we so we can make an informed decision, but to the public as well, uh, because this is very complicated. I think you look at your tax bill and a lot of people don't understand what's there and they, they don't understand how that's made up. So I, I, wanna, I just wanted to thank you and, and, and Linda and Richard and all the staff that was involved in doing this. I know it's been a, a lot of work. Um, I'd also, I just wanna raise one other point or of emphasis on, on the city tax portion and that's the one mil uh, rollback or discount on there. Um, it's my understanding that that was initially put on we're the only city, to my knowledge, that has that. And, and the reason the founders did that, to my knowledge, I was not a part of those committees, but uh, my understanding is that at the time that DeKalb County was under host and that because of we were uh, um, incorporating as a city, we were losing certain rebates that went back to taxpayers for police and other services that now the city was providing. So the taxpayers weren't getting that. So to, to I guess, replace that discount we added a one mil rollback. Now in 2018, when SPLOS came in, am I- ever, that, that year, whatever year it was, 17 or 18. The tax structures changed and, and that rebate actually went back to everybody in the cab. So in essence, we got back, the, the, the taxpayers in Dunwoody got back in the form of a rebate to their county taxes, what was initially intended to discount. So. And I, I don't want to say this in a way that sounds insensitive, but in essence, it, we're double dipping now. We, 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 the, the rollback was put in there to replace a discount that we're now getting again. Okay. So, um, and we're the only person, uh, the um, only person, the only <laughs> municipality that is offering that discount. So not only are we the lowest, but we're actually a full um, mill lower. That is correct. And from and, that number. And a different way that we tie to when I discuss it with the other cities, because we all discuss our millage rates with each other at this time of year, is one of the things that we did in this city in 2008, 2009 was said, we want to mimic this law because we will not receive the benefit. Then in 2017, 2018, the law changed. If that same vote came before the voters, there would be no backup for it now. There would be no saying we're mimicking it. You pay almost zero in county taxes because the sales tax credit goes against it now. And the cities will not see any of that anytime soon. And if so, it'll be a small amount. But you're correct in that not only is it not 2.74 currently, for anyone with a homesteaded property, it's 1.74. So most homesteads are not even close to even that Brookhaven number from previous. Thank you. And I, I just want to point out uh, a few things. Um, this decision to that we're going to vote on tonight, it, you know, this was not an impulsive or a spontaneous decision. This is something that has been on the table for years. Um, this, in fact, my first year on council five years ago, our then finance director actually felt strongly enough about this that he wrote a letter to the council painting the picture of, listen, you're going to have to do this. This is not a matter of if, but when, um, and was recommending doing it at that time, five years ago. Um, we have put this off as long as we can. I think we've tried to be sensitive to the, to the, um, the situations of our families and, and, and homeowners in the city and, and not raise the taxes at all, if, if at all possible. Um, but as you, you know, pointed out very clearly and well in, in your presentation, uh, you know, the city is, you know, really no different than than the residents is, in fact, when inflation hits us too, asphalt costs more, um, maintaining our facilities costs more, um, you know, we have to pay our, our police and our staff more in salaries and, and, and benefits and um, the money's got to come from somewhere. I've served on, the, this will be my, this is my third year serving on the budget committee. And I mentioned that only to say that I think we all spend a, a good amount of time when budget time rolls around diving in, but 
The past three years, I've done an even deeper dive and been involved in all of those discussions and involved in those uh, sessions where we sit there and really deliberate quite hard on, it's not what, what are we gonna add and spend money on, it's what are we cutting? What, what, we wanna do these things, we can't do them. We've got to cut, and I, I think our staff uh, does a very good job of running on a pretty lean budget. Um, they there is n there is there's no fluff, there's no fat, there's no there's no waste, there's no extravagance. We are we are running a pretty tight and lean machine, and I and again I say that with confidence because I've been on the budget committee for three years now, um, and so. This is not a situation that I think that it makes any of us happy. <laughs> I mean, obviously, um, you know, to be the council that raises taxes isn't something that, you know, you put on your, your, your campaign uh, flyer or anything like that. But, um, but unfortunately, also being a leader sometimes means making difficult decisions and unpopular decisions, but the right decisions. Um, could we cut? We could, but does that mean now we're paving less streets? Uh, are we having less police officers, police officers uh, patrol in the city? Um, that, you know, I heard someone say earlier, you know, going back to the cab, well, that's exactly what we'd be. Uh, because I think, yeah, we could, we could pave a few less streets next year, but that catches up to you. And pretty soon you're paying a lot more than you would have just by maintaining. Um, and so I think financially, although not an easy decision and not one that was arrived at quickly or lightly, um, I think it's a decision that we need to make. And so that's just, uh, my comment on that. Um, I'd also just, I, I pointed this out in the beginning of the process. I'll point it out again. Um, I'll use my own personal tax bill. Um, I pay, and it, I say this just to put things in perspective. I pay less in city taxes than I do for my sanitation fee. So for what I pay less for police, parks, paving than I do for once a week trash pickup. I almost said delivery. That would have been bad. <laughs> um, but it, even with even with the proposed millage rate increase, that would basically put my city taxes equal with what my once a week sanitation fee is. And and again, I don't I'm not I'm not making light of any increases. I understand the situation, uh, economic situation the country's in, and a lot of families are in. Um, but it, I, I just want to put in perspective how how many services our residents are getting uh, for the amount of money they're paying. So once again, thank you. And I think I've talked long enough. I'll pass it off. <laughs> Rob, you have anything? I think Tom covered every point I was about to bring up. That was okay. Thank you. Catherine? Okay. So to Tom's point about not easy decisions, I, I think I want to give just a tiny bit of the market or the environment we're working in. So someone's going to have to tell me exactly the time, but I would say somewhere between a year and 18 months ago, we heard a rumor that Sandy Springs was going to raise their police salaries 20%. Is that about the right time? And so we immediately thought, hmm, they were already a little higher than us. Hmm. So we pulled together a committee and we started investigating and we actually had someone at the city call Sandy Springs and they said it was, they didn't know where that came from. That was a rumor, no such thing. We went ahead and did a, Eric, can you clarify the first raise please for me? Uh, yeah. Or Jay, yeah, we're gonna pull a it up. six, eight that's percent right, raise, right. something that's around right. those that's ways. Correct. We were feeling pretty good about ourselves, correct? Yep. Yeah. I'll pull it up. While you okay, six, eight percent raise. Six weeks later, Sandy Springs raised police salaries twenty percent. On top of the need to be, and not only that, we exist in a very strange time. Employment rise, the Great Resignation, twenty-year-olds. We have by far the best benefits. Um, I can highlight some of those for y'all. Um, we give our police, if they live within the city of Dunwoody limits, a stipend. We pay for their continuing education. Our chart for police advancement and salaries recognizes not just time, but also education. We did all that. We refined that a year ago. The benefits have been around for a long time. But when you're in, in, in uh, your health care for the employee is free, um, take home vehicles. But when you're in your early 20s, that doesn't necessarily impress you. What impresses you is the size of your paycheck. On top of that, we're in better shape than a lot of cities where they, their police could actually make more at Target. So we're certainly not at all in that situation. But we had to be competitive. So we did a couple of adjustments. 
correct? Correct. I pulled together the budget committee last week to look at another adjustment in police salaries. First, the police committee looked at it and then the budget committee looked at it. And then that same day, Roswell announced a 20% increase for their salaries and Sandy Springs was right behind them. And so if we want to have our own police department and to be competitive in recruiting, not just officers in general, but the right personnel so we can have the best police department, which I believe we have, we have to be competitive because salaries matter. And whatever's happening in the national economy, some, some of that will come and go, but I don't believe that we're going to see a downturn in salaries. I don't, I don't think Target is going to go back to $12 an hour from 15. I think that's likely here to stay. And so that's just one example of the environment we're working in. Um, I have no mayors across the state that are thinking they may not be able to afford to have police departments anymore. Things are really complicated right now. But it's other things too. Code enforcement is very important to the residents of Dunwoody. They, we, we have a particular problem with vacant houses. We can go to court to get permission to mow the lawn. The last time our community development director put it out for a bid, the bids were in the $900 range to mow a lawn. And so we face the same pressures as everyone else. Um, and we've struggled with this for years. We've known it was coming um, and it's not an easy thing to do, but I, in my belief on how I'm transparent, I think we mislead residents when we say, this is the level of services we're going to offer and we're not really paying for them. We're not really able to pay for them. And this is the level of services people want. So just, you know, you may not be concerned about public safety, but your neighbor may have it as their number one priority. And they think, yay, raise it more so you can pay police officers more. You may not be concerned about parks, but your neighbor may spend every day walking our trails in, in Brook Run Park and in Pernishal Park. And that may be their priority. We all have individual value systems and we all have individual priorities. And we're here, we're here. my job is to provide services today, but to build a community for the future. And so when I look at our neighboring tax neighbors, so it, my friend in DeKalb, her house and my house are mirrored. We were both frozen in 2009. Our valuations are very similar and she's paying $600 a, a year more than we are in Dunwoody or where, where I am in Dunwoody and getting virtually no services. So, the, you know, we, we still are going to be paying less than you'd be paying if we were an unincorporated DeKalb. And so I have a few more notes. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And then, um, and so, you know, the timing is unfortunate. We've been talking about this for three or four years. We probably could have done it a year ago. We were sensitive to the impact of the pandemic, um, but we need to cover the cost. We, we need to be transparent and cover the cost of the services that the residents want. And the founders of the city who based the finances of the city on a study that only looked at one year, the first year of cityhood, they understood the potential to need more income. And that's what this is. And one of the things that the mayor, some of the mayors of Cab and I have been talking about is, is you know, you talk about record property values. Unfortunately, what DeCab appears to do is if you bought your house this year, they freeze it at last year's, like the last property tax value. So we'll we will see if we receive any benefit from that. I remain really concerned about our commercial tax digest, which has had the biggest burden on providing services to the residents. We have two empty office buildings with leases that expire in a year and another one that's just simply empty. And I expect that they will appeal their assessment. And um, I just think we don't know. And then I'll leave you with this. You mentioned sanitation. You mentioned how much it is on your bill. So we're, the Cab County is clearly struggling with sanitation services. And it's a terrible inconvenience. But worse than that, while we had seen big improvements in emergency management services before the pandemic, those improvements have been er erased and it may be worse. And so we very well in the next few months make some decisions that we will use 
to uh, Dunwoody tax dollars to supplement, replace. We don't exactly know the state really ties our hand, but we know we need to be addressing this. And so and we will be working with DeKalb. Um, you know, in the event of a major storm, it's clear that DeKalb would not be able to collect <laughs> yard waste. And any, you know, there's, there's, there's things on the horizon that worry me. And for years, when we would talk about the millage rate, we would talk about whether or not we could roll it back a little bit. And it just made no sense because we had such big needs. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know. We, people could be right. Our revenue could go way up. And then we will have the ability to make different choices. So thank and thank you, Jay and Linda, everybody on the team, um, all the public who has participated over the last several months plus the last several years, we appreciate it. Okay. Um, all right, so Sharon, I think that there's something for you to read, right? Unless, wait, did anybody else have any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'm ready, I'm sorry. The next item on the agenda is a resolution of the mayor and council of the city of Dunwoody, Georgia, to fix the ad valorem tax rate of the city of Dunwoody for fiscal year 2022 and for other purposes. Move to approve. Move by Tom. I'll second that. Second by Rob. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Next up is consent. Does anybody have questions on this? Move to approve. Second. Yep. Move by Tom. Second by Stacy. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Next up is Michael Smith, but I think Sharon, you might have to read it. Moving to the business items, action items. Uh, number 12 is approval of a right-of-way agreement with Brookville Properties for the Ashford Dunwoody Commuter Trail Phase One Project, Michael Smith. Good evening. Um, phase one of the path extends along Ashford Dunwoody in front of Perimeter Mall. The project requires close to an acre of additional right of way and about three tenths of an acre of temporary construction easements to build the path. Uh, this is a project that's been in the planning and design phase for several years and the mall owner Brookfield Properties uh, has agreed to provide the right of way that we need and the easements, which were appraised in 2020 for $4.2 million. Uh, in return, they're asking for consideration from the city for costs that they would incur because of the project and the, and the right-of-way donation or right-of-way transaction. <clears throat> so one of the considerations is the, the large marquee sign in front of the mall that's in the, uh, the path it needs to move for the path to be built. Uh, the, the agreement that's on before you tonight provides for removal and replacement of that sign with a smaller sign that would be moved off of the new right of way and out of the way of the path. Um, other considerations include, you know, basically the, the mall doesn't want to have to pay out of pocket costs associated with, you know, providing this right of way to us. So they have a number of releases that they have to get from the lenders on the property and then some of the the department store um, tenants have easement rights over the property so they've got to get releases from all them and so the the agreement provides for um, up to forty thousand dollars to cover cost of those releases and then up to five thousand dollars for any closing costs that they might incur um, the uh, the PCID uh, Primary Community Improvement District uh, will be presenting to their board in August because this is a project that they're partnering with the city on, and they're going to request from their board in August at their next meeting. Uh, they previously agreed to pay for two thirds of the 
cost of this purchase. Um, and so they're going to present that to their board plus uh, propose to cover the, the lender release cost and the closing cost. So the city, the city's cost in this would be, you know, the a third, about a third of the purchase price, which is $110,000 or so. Um, public works, community development, the city attorney have all been involved in, in putting this agreement together and negotiating with Brookfield. And we're recommending approval with a couple of minor organizational changes in the appendix documents. Um, there's a, the agenda includes an attachment with a, a drawing or picture of what the sign would look like and some dimensions that would go in as appendix D, which are the new sign specifications and um, the text that's in appendix D now would move to appendix F, which is the new sign operating terms and conditions. And so the, the, the dimension shown the style of the sign, the terms and conditions would all be dictated by this agreement. And so they, the mall would be permitted to relocate the sign under these terms and conditions. And I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Um, I just have a quick question. I don't think this is gonna be an issue because to my understanding, the PCID fully is on board with this and, and wants this as, as much as we do. And I, I know they've been working uh, this has been a, a lengthy process to get to this point, but just for point of clarification, um, this is a, a business item that we'll be voting on tonight. Um, what are we, are we voting on that 110,000? Are, are we, is this a conditional vote? If the PCID board, when they vote next month, for some reason decides not to, to contribute, are, are we, are we voting to approve the, the, the full amount? I just want to clarify what we're actually yeah. voting on tonight because I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I would, uh, what we're asking for a vote on is the, the agreement, uh, which includes, I mean, the agreements between the city and Brookfield Properties. So we're asking for approval of that agreement uh, so that the next step would be to move towards a closing, that, which will probably take about 60 days. So it won't be closed until the PCID board meets. So I guess technically you are approving this agreement, but I would say if the PCID comes back and says, you know, we're only going to pay for half the, the purchase or whatever, I would come back to the city council and and bring that back to you if those costs change. Yeah, and, and yeah. I think to further clarify, that would be a substantive change, which means they would have not met the terms that Michael was laying out for y'all. So it would need to come back for another approval at a later time. This thing has been on y'all's blotter for a while and Michael has worked very hard along with Richard McLeod and others to make sure y'all get it. And we just don't want it to be caught up between meetings. If he gets it blessed tonight, those terms, if they're acceptable and get passed and for the next meeting for the other folks, the other board, then we can move this thing along. And I think that's what Michael's trying to do. But if you get a substantive change, it will come back to you. And that would be a substantive change. Okay, I, and, and yeah, and I, I agree we wanna get this moving. I, I just wanted to have clarity on that issue because I uh, just to make sure what we were- <laughs> I'll jump in with a quick question about that. In the staff memo, you said PCID had tentatively agreed to, to pay 75%, but then you said it's two thirds. Um, oh, um, I, I misspoke. It's, it's the memo is correct, 75%. I like that one better, okay. excellent. <laughs> And also to, to rest, you know, we, what we also can do is Sharon can hold this after approval until that approval actually takes place for signature. So we won't sign anything. We're just getting your a blessing in advance, so to speak. Sharon will hold this document with Michael and we won't sign off. I won't, I'll have to sign off too. I won't sign off until we know that approval has happened. <laughs> Will you note that for record, Michael? Just make sure it doesn't get ahead of us. I'll make sure it doesn't well, get ahead I, of the us. The only thing I would say about that is we're, um, you know, upon approval of this, we would move towards closing with the mall. I think the only thing that we're, that's not nailed down at this point is, you know, the PCID's blessing of what they're going to contribute. When are they scheduled to meet, Michael, again? Uh, it's like the third 
Third third meeting. Meeting. Wednesday, this month, or Wednesday in August, I think. So it, they're not meeting in July. So mm. it, it would be a little over a month. And what we're trying to do is start moving this towards closing, real, recognizing that the closing won't happen probably till September. Um, post their meeting. Post their meeting. But because the, the agreement won't change, it's just whether the city wants to, you know, if the CID doesn't put the money in, does this, is the city willing to do that? But the terms of the agreement won't change. It's just who's paying for what. I so, wonder if we can ask Ann Hamlin to have a called meeting. You could probably ask. I her could probably ask her that, right? Yeah, yeah she's yeah, a little busy right now, but so how do we work this out? So we, but we would still know before closing yes. if they weren't going to pay this. Yeah, and I think that the whole deal is what you're getting, the value of what you're getting is what Michael's pushing, whether you have, whether they match or not, because of what you're getting in right away. Is that correct, Michael? Yeah. And, and I think there's a, I mean, the recommendation from the CID staff is going to be. For right. They're pretty good at. This, so, particularly the yeah. the cab one. I mean, worst case scenario, if they come back say we want to split it 50 50, that's, that's and the really amount we're talking that. about here is the 45,000, or am I? We're, they're no. they're going to propose to pay all the 45. The CID is. And they've already committed to 75%. You think they're going to change their minds and go backwards? Is that what we're worried about? No, well, no. Um, but the from when they, voted on that two years ago all the costs have gone up okay so the the amount is more right. so um so i guess if you want to put it i'm fairly confident that at the you know right now the city would be in it for around one hundred and ten thousand. i'm fairly confident that worst case scenario that number would go up to 200 if they came back and said we want to split it all 50 50. And that's in exchange for getting about four million dollars right. worth of the property. property is so worth that's why dollars. Michael's doing it this way. Okay, well, we'll we'll talk to Ann about whether she can go ahead and have a called meeting potentially when she gets back. Anybody else, Catherine? Will the landscape buffer include or require shade? Is this just low plants? Or there, there's quite a bit of landscaping with this, and that. We'll be coming back at another point for the actual construction funding agreement. And you'll see with that that the CID has agreed to pay for some extra landscaping and pavers and to make it look nice. So, um, yeah, there's a full landscape plan. And, and we're a lot of the trees that are out there now are, will not be impacted. But we do have to remove some trees, but a lot of the the bigger trees along in front of the mall now will not be impacted. Is the digital billboard an, an exception? Yes, and if you have questions about that, Richard might be the best to answer any questions about that. But yes, it is an exception from our current code. And, and, and let me let me lead into this. I want to be very cautious about there was there's some legal guidance involved in what's in this terminology with Richard's help and Richard's staff. I, I don't want to have an on the meeting minutes that might lead others to be detractors at a later date. But I think if Richard wants to comment, Richard worked very hard on this language. Uh, Richard, do you want to comment? Um, we worked under the advisement of the attorneys at the time because of, of the billboard. Um, there's a thing in our code, our sign code, that says if the city requires a sign to move, they can move it. Gotcha. So that's one of the things that uh, we're doing. So. Okay, so and then it would still adhere to our lighting standards you know, whatever we passed with light ordinances Correct. that would fall under that. Yes. And then it looked like there was, they had the choice as to whether they had allow law enforcement to use the billboard. Is that something That's correct. you advocate for and hope they say yes? So some communities choose to use 
for example, um, if there's a missing persons, they can post it on there. Um, it's and we covered that so in our agreement. It didn't look covered in the agreement, I and mean, that's why I'm bringing it up. It looked like they can choose to allow. They, they can. I mean, that's all. Is there? That's their that's all the agreement there. is going to say. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Okay. All right. That's all I had. Thanks. Brad. The only comment I have is I, I think for the price, this is a great opportunity for beautification, some good traffic control in the area and adding some recreational amenities for a lot of the folks that live over there that don't have a lot of uh, opportunities. Okay. Yeah. Can, can, I, yes. can I, I feel like uh, I probably have put a little notch in this thing. I don't wanna overly right. put the notch. We had this reviewed by outside folks as well for concerns this city has about signs in general. I can assure you that while we can't become an insurance carrier, that we've done everything we can to address the city's prior concerns and the city's ongoing concerns, realizing we're making an improvement on somebody else's property and knocking out their sign as part of that and they're donating the land, the land to us. Uh, is can we mitigate all risk? We've mitigated everything we can mitigate, not knowing the landscape of where the law might go in the future. So I hope you know that it wasn't just that wasn't a cursory event. There's been a lot of back and forth on that issue. We've been working on this for years. Two years. I'm sure I just wanted that clear for the right. record. But like before it was Brookfield, right? Or did was it just with Brookfield? Yeah. Before Brookfield. And so Brookfield is the largest or one of the largest commercial landowners in the country, in the world maybe. And I think the challenge with messaging on the sign is who's gonna answer the phone. That's what you call, that's small management is tricky. So with that, if there's no more discussion. Move to approve. Move by Tom. Second. Second by Rob. And I also think maybe Richard, this sign is smaller, right? or is it different dimensions? It's different looking, it yes, looks better. It is smaller. It is smaller. So they would not have taken the other sign down. And so this is, you know, this is a smaller sign. It's less whatever. All right, um, any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes. The next item on the agenda is approval of amendment of city position allocation and compensation chart. Nicole Stoika. Oh, she's here. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. We are seeking authorization tonight to amend the city's uh, compensation chart and to administer pay increases to all city employees. Um, we're asking for this proposal, we're presenting this proposal due to inflation and local market changes as you've been addressing tonight, uh, keeping both recruitment and retention in mind. Um, we did present this to the budget committee on July 1st and it met with unanimous approval there. So we're bringing it to the full council tonight. The proposal includes increasing the city's salary ranges for all positions by 6%, increasing the officer hiring grid by that same 6%, increasing pay for officers, detectives, sergeants, and lieutenants by 6%, and then increasing pay for all other city positions by 4%. Um, as was noted earlier, we have not done one large 20% increase at one time like some of our neighboring cities have done. But just to recap, if approved tonight, this would be the fourth increase since March of 2021. And so since that time, it would amount to an average increase of 20.8% for all officers, detectives, and sergeants, 15% for lieutenants, and 13% for all other city employees. The cost for this proposal is about 398,000 on an annual basis, and that would be covered by the millage rate increase. If approved tonight, we'll put these changes into effect June 30th, which means that employees would see them in a July paycheck. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions, Stacy? Anything, Tom? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Uh, Nicole, thank you again. This was a lot of work. This was not something that was easily uh, arrived to. There's there's a lot of um, research that goes into this. This isn't just random. Hey, let's throw the numbers on a chart. Uh, so there's I, so I appreciate all the work that you have put into this. Um, I just want to point out also just for the record that the majority of 
city staff, city employees are police officers. So this is this the majority of this is going to our police department, and um, we've already talked about the importance on of public safety. Um, and um, you know, there's questions about where where the millage rate. Inc well, this is basically about forty percent of the millage rate is going directly to this. So I just wanted to clarify those points. And thank you again, Catherine. And I want to clarify that mayor and council are not involved in this. Right, race. we get no money. Right, no, no money. correct. That's okay. good. A raise. Um, I have a question, and it might not be for you, but I also thought the budget committee recommended increasing the housing stipend. Is it in the? Is it on? I don't know if it's in today's, but it will be brought forth, I believe, in a budget amendment. And there were a couple of other things, I think, right? Or maybe that was just the it. other one was a vacation request. And oh. actually, that's under Eric's purview. So okay. we've already done that. Okay. Just to put three days of vacation already on the board. So. Okay. And Special. Oh, right. There's a four thousand $4, dollar bonus. What do we call it? A bonus or adjustment? For special units That's like right. Right. it'll be bonus and DC Carlson is presenting that later. Right. So we're gonna talk about that later. And the housing, the housing stipend is something that we, we go ahead and it's a policy and we set the budget for that is the way that works. We can go ahead and change that policy and we just provide uh do a budget adjustment for that as well. And there's a clear benefit in for communities when their police officers live within their city limits. Absolutely. And so just to clarify, we're currently $700 a month and we're um, proposing that it goes up to $800 a month to match Brookhaven. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Thank you. Go ahead. And, and this, I guess it's indirectly related to this kind of maybe at the, the folks on the budget committee that are here. Um, <clears throat> we have discussed intermittently some sort of longevity bonus for police officers. Did that come up in your discussions at all to try to encourage folks to stick around for for longer periods of time? No, we were looking at the um, the present day and just trying to attract and retain. The city does have a longevity bonus in place already, not specifically for, for police officers, but for all city employees. So that goes into effect at year five and it's $200 per year of service. And to just to reiterate what someone said, we have staff, so we are a public private form of government. And so, most of our employees actually work for contractors with the exception being, the great exception being the police department. I don't even think that's allowed under Georgia law. And so the majority of our employees who benefit from the overwhelming majority of our benefits who is, is our police department. Our police department is 78 employees so of our 109 total and mm -hmm. that 109 includes the seven of you. No, and we did none of this, not one cent of this affects us, just to be clear, Correct. just to be clear, not one cent. So, um, all right, so any further discussion? This is an action item. Move to approve. Moved by Councilman Harris. Second. Moved by Council, seconded by Councilman Lambert. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you. The last action item is an agreement concerning funding for Arts and Nature Center. Jay Benicki. Uh, Mayor and Council, this is a small update. Uh, at a previous meeting, you already approved for us to negotiate with the Dunwoody Nature Center and with the Scroll Arts Center on an agreement to where each of them would receive $1 million of matching money on their own raised money. Uh, during some of the discussion with that, we realized there was a small oversight, and that's what's before you today. The Dunwoody Facilities Authority, of which you are also members, will need to be a signatory to this also since they are the actual property owners. So we're bringing this back before you to, to ratify that change and we put the new draft in there. A secondary thing that was suggested at a council, and since we had to revise it anyway, we added in there a clause that required competitive procurement, which both parties were planning to do. It just codifies it. And that's what we've brought before you today. We will also be uh, pulling together the Dunwoody Facility Authority at either the next meeting, the 25th or the next one. Uh, we need to do two things. One, as a Dunwoody Facilities Authority, you would need to approve this. And the secondary one is the changes to the Spruill Art Center. Only the kiln room was approved. The other was held off. So they will present that and the Facility Authority would also have to ratify that improvement also. Thank you. 
and that would be at a later date. Anybody have, so you're, this is an action item though. That, that is so correct. anybody have questions or comments? Rob. Again, kind of a tangential question. Um, just do we know status of round two of the ARPA money? Is that? It is in hand, it, is, okay. it, has, been, it has been awarded. Okay. It's, it's not in our bank account yeah. yet, but it's coming. No, because no. there's a process, but the state has it. It's, Sorry. It's on its way. The checks it's, in the mail. There you go. That's, Ish. That was my Ish. question. <laughs> Ish. Okay. It's an action item. Move, Move to approve. Second. Moved by Rob. Second by Stacy. All in favor, say aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes. Thank you. Oh, me too. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can go first. Uh, the next item here, um, I'm happy to present this project agreement with Georgia Department of Transportation for um, a path on North Shalford. The Last year, the city applied for some federal funds for this project through Atlanta Regional Commission, and we recently were awarded those funds, uh, $560,000 towards the design of this project, which would go from uh, Shambly Dunwoody Road down to Cotillion Drive on North Shalliford Road. And uh, the federal funds are administered by uh, GDOT. And so in order to access those and begin the design process, we need to approve this project agreement with, with the Department of Transportation. And so we're recommending approval of that. Any questions? Catherine, sorry. So is this typical of how federal funding works? I'm, I just don't know. Most, most transportation funding, yes. It, it's uh, divided into the states and then the regional commissions within the states, uh, especially in large urban areas. The, most of the money is allocated by Atlanta Regional Commission uh, and then some of it by GDOT, but when it actually comes to doing the projects, you know, Atlanta Regional Commission will say, we recommend this money for this project, but then the DOT is actually responsible for working with the local government to make, to get the project done. So how are they going to work with you? Are you just, are they just generally checking in on what you get? Do you get full use of, you we, know, we'll, do it the way you want? Do, do you we, get that? We do it, yeah, we'll do it generally the way we do all of our projects. The, only, the biggest difference is at, at steps along the way, we have to get GDOT approval. Um, it's a local road, so we have pretty good latitude on what we can do, but there's a process based on federal regulations that you have to follow, and GDOT's there to basically make sure you follow that process. Does it materially slow it down? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes. the, the, the pro, you know, we've already talked to the consultant that's going to be managing this for GDOT and their first stab at a schedule was, hey, we're looking at construction in 2026, so. So as an antidote, when we were talking about some of the projects that the cities are working on with the managed lanes, originally my friends to the south and not very far, the mayors there, they didn't want to take federal funds for this multi bazillion dollar project because it would slow it down and those kind of projects. Yeah. So they changed their mind. So, well, and, and we, that's one of the reasons we tend to only go after federal money on bigger projects, um, you know, say, right. One and a half, two million plus dollar projects because it does take longer in it because it takes longer. It, costs a little more too. So you need the money to be worth it. Anybody else? Consent, okay. Consent, please. All right. And then the last item I have is, uh, you know, a few years ago, Discover Dunwoody started a process working with the city and the CID to look at uh, branding, gateway signage, wayfinding signage throughout the city. They went through a selection process and selected TSW to, to prepare that um, 
those concepts for, for gateway signage. And uh, in December 2020, Michael Starling presented those plans and the council ap approved those con conceptual designs. And so, and then earlier this year, uh, funding was allocated um, from some of the uh, money we received over the last year, we allocated $500,000 towards actually doing the installation of these signs. And so the proposal before you here is um, to go ahead because TSW has been involved since the beginning and has done this, we just ask them for a proposal to complete the construction documents that would be needed to bid bid this work for installation of the signs. And so the the cost of this for sixteen locations throughout the city is eighty two thousand four hundred dollars. Catherine. I was on Discover Dunwoody when we chose the signage. I'm delighted, excited, thrilled that people know we're entering and exiting Dunwoody. And I love that the number of sites, I don't see the big swing. Is that- like That's a, not in this. I see that it's not in that. And yet I would love to see that at a future date. Is that still in off in the wings? Yeah, yeah I don't, uh, we're not saying that we're not gonna do that. It's just, we felt like let's go ahead and get this because there's also the wayfinding signs too and so and which is not in here so we kind of are breaking this up saying hey let's get the gateway monument signs in as a first step and then there's other things maybe you can come after that once we've successfully done this okay and will the mural be going through the arts commission uh, it can i i need to i need to we probably need to talk about that internally and see how that should work. Okay, thank you. Rob, do you have anything? Just th this doesn't include the, uh, I guess I'll call it the furniture store property. Is that, is it, that's something separate? It, it does, it currently it? does include that. Okay. And, and I, I thought about that. And the reason we went ahead and included it is, you know, they, that developer got their zoning but I don't think they've gotten a land disturbance permit yet. And so I thought it's probably might be a good idea for us to go ahead and design it and have it ready in case the oh. development doesn't go through. But the location on the, in the contract appears different than where I thought we were in as part of it was going to go on the hill by the furniture store and the contract had it in the median. And that was that was one of my questions. Are we doing this in addition to or in, in place of that sign? So just to make sure that TSW is clear where the location that we intend for that to go, because it, on the contract, it shows it going in the median on Ashford Dunwoody instead of on the hill by the store. Well, and I think uh, the idea was, so if, if the store gets built, then they're going to dedicate some right away and they're going to have that hillside built in. But if, if nothing happens there, then the backup plan would be to go in the median here because I'm not sure if the if we would have enough right of way to do it ourselves there. You know, I was just asking if Richard's heard anything. Is he still here? Yeah, no. no, he left. Okay. I was wondering if we've heard anything from the furniture store, like if they've started filing permits or something. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I went through the contract and, and I kind of plotted out all of the, the locations. Um, I think we've done a good job of hitting the gateways, except for one, uh, Happy Hollow and Dunwoody Club. Was that an oversight or was there a reason that wasn't included? I, I think, I'm not sure that one was was ever in their plan. I mean, we could add one there, but I think um, that just wasn't part of the overall plan originally. Yeah, I mean, that's the only entrance into the city that's not covered. And that is a, gets a pretty fair amount of traffic from Sandy Springs into the city. I, I would like, and again, we don't need the, the big, it could be one of the smaller, but I, I think it, it would be appropriate. It would be inappropriate to leave that one location off. Okay. Um, we can uh, have them modify their proposal. I mean, just based on what they propose for the other locations, you're, you're probably looking at another four or $5,000 maybe. Are you done? I'm oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. I was like, huh, I wonder if he's done. Um, right. Anybody else? 
Thank you. All right. And this, are you, when are you planning on, we've got some questions. Are you going to try to get them answered before? I can, yes. Okay, that, that would be helpful. Thank okay. you. Mr. Vinicky. Uh, <coughs> Mayor and Council, next up is a discussion item on the capital list, which we've been in discussions with for the past <coughs> few months on this. Uh, we're bringing this to Council tonight to have an open discussion and some guidance because one of the things that has been discussed is whether there will be a call of election this year. And that decision has to be made by the end of the month, which would be for us on July 25th, and then we would need a special call meeting of the Board of Elections. Uh, currently, there's been a revised list, which is posted on the website and that we can pull up here. But one of the things that um, staff doesn't have a feel for is whether or not at this point we do want to move forward on this. There are alternatives of either moving forward for this year, looking back and revising it and putting it on a ballot for next year. In either way, it would be out there. We also can incorporate our capital plans for 2023 talking about this as part of the process because that could be something where projects could be put on during that process that said these would be bondable. Uh, currently we've had a lot of discussions about whether or not we would have multiple ballot questions on there. In other words, the biggest delineation would be transportation, um, uh, parks, one of each. Also just for clarification, all things with trails can either be put into transportation or parks. You just must be consistent in it if so. Another thing that we don't have is a good feel for the total amount that, that the, the council would be looking at. And also, a, as I call it, a spin down plan. We've talked about whether or not we would do some things for three or four years and then pick up pace in year four and five. It needs to be arranged in that time. And these are decisions which would need to be made before anything is put on a ballot. And there are still discussions that are in the air and are still active discussions. And we're not saying one way or the other of it, but trying to get the council's feedback so that we can prepare something for the next council council meeting if needed. So I thought we were going to talk about the project list. Um, so can we pull that out maybe? I mean, I don't know what anybody else feels like. Huh? Yeah. It's going to be a bit because... We can, does anybody have anything they want to talk about before the list comes up? Because we can do that while we wait. This is just general discussion. So I have concerns with the multipurpose trails that we're not far enough, despite what some people think, we're not far enough along in the process to be able to succinctly describe where the funds would go. There's so many, um, unknowns and um, I'm trying to think the right word because uncertainty is not really the word I'm trying to say, it's still you, um, that we know we want, we have trails we planned on having, um, but I'm not sure we have enough to confidently go forward with those. I mean, the so the trails in the perimeter, which are funded through different partnerships and stuff, we have a good sense of those. We know what we'd like to do a lot eventually around 285, but we can't do anything until the managed lanes project starts, or at least we know it's gonna start. And so that's just my feeling on trails, open for discussion with other people, but that's just my feeling. Catherine. I, I would agree on that path. It's not only what we would do, but what we could do in the time given. That's a real concern. In, in terms of being prepared for any bond discussion, I think we need to know what we are able to build in a, in a reasonable time frame. So I, sticking with it, I have a question then. Are, you know, the, the, the process of you know, imagining, you know, developing conceptual, developing engineer drawings, that is something that we could do within this time frame is identify priority segments and get some of the engineering done, you know, so that we are ready to turn a shovel down the road as we get funds. And so I think that if, even though we may not have very many shovel ready projects, we can use 
trail or we can we can allocate money to develop these projects is that my misunderstanding how we can use these funds for the for the for, for a potential bond yeah I have no yeah. idea uh, could you restate that and I also have Tommy Ratchford here to help us on so that. It, it, the concern I'm hearing is that we don't have a lot of shovel ready trail projects and there's a concern with the spending time frame if we put a bond forward and if the citizens approve the bond those are two both those those things have to happen but we could use this funny this this funding to develop the engineering for segments that we identify as for, for the creation and development of property You're so correct. we may not complete anything within this time frame but we can sure design and get input on and prepare so that in the future as we develop funding we're ready to go on these is that correct Correct. The, re the one recommendation or the advice I would give on that is if we say we're going to build the park, then we're building the park or building the trail. Uh -huh. And if we only complete part of it, we're going to be obligated to finish the rest. And you may, uh, I'm not going to say shortfall on funding, but like if you issue a $10 million bond and you design 10 million, that's the end of it. You're going to issue more for the construction. So, but, but could it be phrased that we're going to design the trail? Yes. All right. I, I can do yeah. So that that to, to me that's a that's a potential solution to this idea that we're not we're not ripe for the trails because a lot of these trails aren't ripe. We're still getting a lot of feedback and 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 you know kind of figuring out what what's going to be going on. Can you scroll down a little bit. Mm Can you still see that on the screen? Shrunk it down some. And again, this is a list of things that have been, as, as I say, um, worked on for the past few months. It's a, it's a non-inclusive, things can always be added and, and, and subtracted from it from the starting point. So what are we doing tonight? Are we adding and subtracting or are we? So I'm not, I'm, I think we need to talk about, so to your point about trails, for example, I think that we can, we can fund some design and engineering from our regular budget, right? Michael Smith is here, I think. Right in here with a shed. The answer is yes. On that. Right. Madam Mayor, yes. to that point, I think Councilman Price's point is if you do direct fund out of general fund, some advanced planning, design, whatever, mm -hmm. I would like y'all to pass a reimbursement resolution in advance of that so that if you later bond mm -hmm. it, you could get reimbursed yourself back for what you pre planned, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. If you spend money before the reimbursement resolution, you would not be able to get it back. So if you're going to use general fund money to advance design costs, engineering, et cetera, right. you want to make sure you pass okay. a reimbursement resolution. I actually don't think that's what Rob was saying. I think Rob was saying. That's a good second point. Um, <laughs> right. He was saying that we could fund it from the bond, right? I, I was suggesting Maybe I that if we don't have enough projects ready right. within the time frame that we instead focus funding on developing projects for down the road from a bond from a bond so that from, so okay. that later when we allocate capital resources those projects are further along and ready to go so so uh my personal thing is is that i think we ought to to look at I'd rather have some more shovel ready projects. That's just where I am. That's just where my head is in terms of the trails. I think there's too much discussion out there. I think we have had some community misunderstandings and I think we need to step back um, to John Hennigan's point. I think people want trails potentially maybe until they're in their neighborhood or in front of their neighborhood, but also what they're gonna look like and is it gonna look differently? And I think we can, if I'm not, over speaking, overstating, and I think we can do some of that in house before a bond with a reimbursement thing. Eric, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then, for example, 
I don't see spending seven million dollars at Brookrun Park. The park is sorry, I don't sp see spending seven million dollars. The park has just opened with its newest amenities. It's really busy. There is zero parking on most weekend days. And I would put in the bathrooms by the dog park. And maybe that's all. Um, I, somebody could argue something else. Go ahead, Stacey. I would um, argue the um, oh, the maintenance the, the, the maintenance shed and then the picnic pavilion um, by Treetop Quest and the dog park right. bathroom. But yeah, so minor things that are not the bulk of that $7 million. Um, I think the park is developed enough. Uh, is, go ahead. Is this the most current list? Because it still has the Nature Center and... Uh, I had there. pulled up what was available on the web. I okay. didn't, I was, it was originally in the packet and then taken out. So I pulled up what I could get to quickly. Okay. Um, just to help me, could you just go ahead and delete the nature center and art center because, and that will help squeeze it a little bit so we can see it all at once possibly. It's like all good things. It's very tiny on this monitor. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> Where are they on? And then I thought we were going to use ARP money for the boardwalk replacement because it was stormwater. Am I mistaken? Maybe I didn't recommend that yet. Did you think so too? We, we have a stormwater category and this is like all things. We as staff are not changing this at this point because we get individual feedback and we need collective feedback. So collective feedback, I think, was that we were going to use ARP funding to do the stormwater improvements at the Nature Center. Does anybody disagree? There you go. And I think the collective feedback is also Brook Run. Yeah. Reduce that to the maintenance shed, right. the restrooms. And the, the pavilion. pavilion. And there was also some discussion. There's also a separate item on there for... Um, the Veterans Memorial. Right. I, th I think you have some update on that. I, th I think we can pull that out because I, I think between what we could possibly do out of pocket or from a general fund as well as we might get from DeKalb County right. because at Veterans Memorial, it's a Veterans Memorial for all of DeKalb County. So I've spoken with a couple of commissioners who are very intrigued with the design and they're waiting the final design and the final cost to see if um, we can get contributions from DeKalb County. So I think that is something that we can um, I would agree with that. Right. So I think the question is, is what else on this project list? I mean, there's a lot of to be determined because of trails. And then also the Peachtree Middle School, that can't be in a bond because we I, don't own that property. I agree. So, I would like to I mean, I don't think it well. can be on, unless the school system is going to sell it. It, it, would, it would take extra steps. Right, right. So anyway, I'm just trying to shrink it so we can... Oh, I guess we are seeing it all one now. The uh, second comment I'll have here, we have for the Roberts Drive and Vermac properties to implement the park design. And I don't believe that we have those yet. No, we, we're, I, I don't think we're ready to bond stuff yet, but that's just my thought. And I know it's disappointing, but I think we need more time to flesh out priorities um, but I'm one vote, so I do the will of the council. I, I have a personal preference to, uh, I think, with a little bit of elbow grease, we could get to a workable list mm -hmm. in time to put something before the voters this fall, um, if at all possible. But I also appreciate the concerns of the rest of the council. Catherine? I, I do not feel ready. I mean, I, I think we're think. barely on the... I feel we're closer on the Austin site. I I don't have I don't know. If we've discussed Vermac, and um, you know, we all want to move in the right direction. Right. But I think we want to do it in the right way. Right. It's a big it's a big decision. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was I was just going to say. Um, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say more than that, but. Um, um, you know this. This is this. This is tricky for me <laughs> um, because I believe this is something that's very important for the city, um, and I don't think there's ever going to be a perfect time to do it. Um, and the longer we wait, the more it's going to cost us in the long run because 
building cost inflation. Um, we're lucky that we live in Atlanta, which is one of the highest building cost inflation cities in the entire country. So um, at, at, I, I hear the concerns and, and I understand the concerns. Um, if, if it is the consensus of the, of the council to, to punt, <laughs> I, I want that to be with a very clear um, marching orders uh, for, our, for ourselves and for staff to make sure that this is ready to go at the, at the earliest time that we're ready to present this to the public in a way that we feel that they can um, approve and accept it. Um, you know, I do believe, you know, I, and I, I think that's, that, that guideline needs to come from us because I don't think it's been clear, quite honestly. Um, you know, do we need full scale design, shovel ready plans? I, I don't think we do. I think um, the, I'm, cer I'm certain there would be others that would disagree, but I think quite honestly, we've should have built enough faith and goodwill with the community with what we've done at Brook Run. I mean, that whole process, and that was done quite honestly, half of that was funded by a, a county bond. Um, that would not have happened without bond money. Absolutely. So that it's it's clear to, you know, we need to make that clear and nothing is gonna happen in the other parks without bond money. The, the cost of these projects, I mean, clearly exceed what we're able to fund out of, out of our general fund. So um, if, if we want these parks and if we wanna develop them, uh, we're, we're going to have to, the public is going to have to make a decision is, right. is what they want. Um, I don't think we need to be, uh, you know, I think we have some con some concept plans for the two parks put together that I think give a general idea. I, I think the public knows the process that we go through to get to a final um, design and, and implementation. Um, and Honestly, a part of this at some point is going to have to be tr trusting us to make the right decisions. Absolutely. Um, I and I also, I mean, I, I think everyone here knows my positions on trails, um, and um, but I also do understand that I want to make sure again because these are not um, um, easy project that they, they won't get completed without a bond, and and so I don't know from a from a practical standpoint. Um, I know there is economies of scale when issuing a bond that below a certain amount, it's not really practical to issue um, in terms of your expenses and all that. Um, so is there a possibility of issuing a bond related strictly to park projects, um, parks proper, not trails, um, and completing those and then at some point in the future, issuing one covering a trail system. We can work, those can be worked into any resolution put out before the voters. Would it be in a single resolution though, or would it be two separate resolutions? Uh, the driving factor on that is how far apart we would be in the money issue. So in other words, do you, um, that's back to the decision points that need to be made before the voters, because when when the city council calls for the ballot, we will actually put down the year by year principal amount in it. And that's where within if we were going to do it for an issuance for a vote for this year, we would need to have that nailed down next Monday, basically, to nail down how minutes. we're going to spend it out. Mm -hmm. um, so you could do a smaller one that would do part of it, like, and I'm just going to shoot from the hip here, do Vermac and Austin as a, and I'm just going to pick random figures here of 20 million for those two now. And you could do a separate call for trails for, I'm just going to say 24 that we don't issue for five more years. And I want to make sure Tommy, I am not misspeaking, correct? If I did two ballots where I did one that was 20 million for parks and then 24 million for trails as two separate votes in November, I, and I could issue the 20 million in February and not issue the 24 for three more years. So that could be. What, how would the issuing it in two separate questions, is it, is it still one total bond package from, a, a, from the perspective of all of the expenses that go along with issuing a bond? I, technically we would be doing probably two separate issuances. So it would be more expensive to do it that way. A tad. Now the, the 
other more driving factor is knowing how we're going to and when we're going to spend the money. So the 24 million would be in years um, making them up all 2027, 2028, where the first bond issuance would be 2023, 2024. They would start a little bit sooner and one would start a little bit later. There would be double issuance cost on there. Um, also the updating of things like the operating statement would be literally nil because we would be updating it two years after the fact. Uh, part of it is having kind of almost a capital plan for the bonds is what we would be having to work on in a very quick pace. Okay, Councilman Lambert, so I just want to make sure I we're, and I, everything Jay said is correct, but I, what I think I understand is you would have multiple questions, ballot questions, your, your time sequence for whether it was a, 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 a taxable or non-taxable issuance would depend on the clocks and you'd have two separate clocks. The reason why that is of potential value to you, I don't think anybody's ever, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't think we've ever explained why does it matter to have a tax exempt issue versus a non-tax exempt issue. And I think we ought to say that so y'all know. Uh, and Tommy, come stand up here because you're gonna correct me. <laughs> if I say one word wrong, correct me. But the market, no matter what the rates are, you get a, a better rate at a tax exempt, but you have a bigger market for the tax exempt rate if you can fit within that calendar of the three year rule that we've been talking about. Why is that value? If people are buying tax exempt issues, there's a chance that you may get a premium on the bonds because of your excellent financial status. So that premium may be large enough that the bonds, instead of selling at 100%, sell at 105%. And guess what you've done? You, your market has paid the cost of the issuance and you still get 100% of the proceeds or 101 potentially. So far, have I said anything wrong? Yes, so having, uh, you still have to have multiple questions, but having one ballot, meaning it's on one ballot, but multiple questions, and different issuance times has two twofold factor. Number one, it allows you to have more time to plan, right? And your issuance drives the three the three year rule, and your issuance date drives whether it's tax exempt or not. So you get savings if it's tax exempt because the rates a little bit better, not much, but a little bit better but you potentially have a bigger market to sell the bonds to, and you may sell them at a premium. And that premium is important, y'all, because you actually, I'm gonna use this loosely, you may make money on the issuance because it may cover more than the cost so that you got more to put down on the deal. Does that make sense to what I've just said? I don't think anybody's explained why you might wanna, why everybody drives you to tax exempt there's a bigger market for them and, and they're a little bit safer to, to people buying them. And, and I think it would drive a premium. Tommy, can you add anything to that? Yeah, but, bonds are currently selling for a premium, but come be close good. to the mic so they can hear you. Um, yes. In the last four or five years, I've typically sold for premium, um, which means you issue fewer in terms of dollar amount of the bonds and yield more proceeds to get your projects done. So let's say your costs are 20 million. You only really issue $17 million worth of bonds because there's $3 million worth of premium. But I think Doug and the folks at Davenport could walk through those numbers a little bit better than I could. Um, but essentially, you're, I don't, I don't know if it's earning more, but it's your, you have more at hand um, to build the projects when you're issuing less in principle. If that makes sense. And so part of your question could include, well, it will include the cost of engineering, design construction and purchase of land, et cetera, and anything associated with that. So I think what I'm hearing you say is if you had a single, if you put on one ballot, could you do different tranches, different issuances? And the answer is if they were approved that way by the public, yes, you could. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Where I kind of am, I'm not ready to give up on it yet, but I look at this list and um, for a couple things, like we just bought the, the Vermont property, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago? Not that a, long. A year ago. So, and we say future city of Dunwoody Park. And I just, you know, I think at some point the taxpayers are going to look at us and say, well, 
when it when is the future here? Like, when is it here? But I don't think that we're in a place where we're going to put $10 million for land acquisition on a bond in November because we're not doing anything with the land that we have now. So I would delete that right now and today, tonight. Um, I would love to know what the estimated cost is when we talk about the bathrooms at Brook, uh, the bathrooms at Brook Run, the, I know. That, um, I don't know what it is. Okay. Um. <laughs> oh, hold your right hand out like this and wave your left hand. Um, the maintenance facility, the picnic pavilion by Treetop Quest, the dog park bathrooms, what does that actually look like? I mean, I think we all agree that that is something that should be done at Brook Run. Um, Vermac Road, we, at some point, it can't just be a future park, it has to be a, a park for today. Um, and then Waterford, I would love to see that finished off. So if, if I look at that and I hear we always, we've always talked about 30, 40, and 50, I don't think we need to reach for 50 if we're going to do it. I mean, I think that we have a, I do think we have a list. So are we open to making it smaller and actually having stuff to do that I think our citizens would like done sooner rather than later? That's, but I will say, I want to make sure that the list is good and solid and that it can be done sooner rather than later and that there's no utility relocation involved. <laughs> hmm. okay. So one potential is just to do a parks bond and come back after a year or two. I mean, you're, you're describing a scenario where we put them both on the same ballot. Well, that was my question because I didn't know the the financial implications of doing it in separate issuances or or on one ballot, and and I wanted to make because I didn't know if the savings were significant enough to warrant putting them together now uh, in a way that would allow us the time to properly plan. But but then again, you're putting it before the public, perhaps uh, a project that they're not seeing a clear picture of what they're voting on. So um, right. I think the trails are a money mess. I mean, right now, I think I, I don't I don't disagree. The parks are more straightforward just because they're easier. There may be some utility movement, but mostly there's not. It's just clear. We talked about a 30 million dollar floor really is what we wanted to do bonds. Do we have 30 million of parks? Do you have to have 30 million? No, that was no, financially you, what you had recommended. There's, is yeah, there's a sweet spot of 30 to 50. Once you get into the 20, you're getting into a, a small issuance. It is still acceptable, but generally somebody our size will do 30 or bigger in this situation. But 20 would be permissible, and, and it would just be a small bond issuance is what it would be. Can you sell those small bond issuances? Yes. Well, I was asking the bond person. He, you he, have he to, he's the lawyer. He don't say. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Dunwoody will have. I can guarantee you this: if a bond is ever sold by the city, there will be people to buy it. That is guaranteed with our credit rating. So I guess I need to define. We need to define next steps. So one potential thing is to bring back this list with just parks with updated numbers with updated numbers take off the stuff no land acquisition particularly or maybe somebody decides and i think what should happen is is um that should be the first step is or not well, not first step because we're running out of time talk to me about 2023 and what the rules are in georgia in terms of ballots You're checking if we can do a spring one and i'm not we can't Third, th third Tuesday in March could be another. We okay. have two possible dates next year. Okay. So third Tuesday in March okay. is a set is a secondary one, which would then make your issuance be in or your bond selling in June or July. Okay. Or in fact, as early as May. Right. We We'd pay it. for a separate election. Is that what you're suggesting? No, there's already a ballot on. There should be one that it would be. It, it is a special election. We might have to pay for the election. Yeah, my, my, my preference would be. <laughs> Whenever we put it on, we put it on when 
we're likely to get the most voter feedback on it. Right. And uh, so that's my concern with next March is that that I think would be very low turnout. Yeah. And I, to me, if we're going to be issuing a bond, I want to hear from as many people as possible about that. And are there no other elections that aren't special in 23? Is it just the local? It's just the local election. I think it's just it's just okay. twice a year. They change some, the some years there's lots of elections. Some we're, years li we're limited in 2023 to two. OK, days. in the. Um, OK. I feel better about parks only. I, I mean, I think that's reasonable and definable and doable. So what I think I would ask staff is to look at the parks only items and bring it back to us in two weeks. Okay. Uh, let me also make sure I'm clear. In two weeks, we would need to bring you a resolution to be voted on. Well, then we will have to make a decision on that day. What we will try to do then is try to get you advanced copies and we'll, we'll, we're going to have to get a little bit creative without some guidance on here, but I think between Brent, myself and the finance team and everybody else, we can get you a workable doc, we, we can get you a workable document for the next agenda. So, well, I have concerns, as I just said it, I think the guidance from uh, the people up here is the parks projects man it minus I think the land acquisition, though I'm not sure everyone agrees on that. Or maybe a go ahead, Catherine. I think we can keep it as an option. Okay. I would like I would like to keep it as an option for now. I, it's kind of pie in the sky, but it would be nice if we could get like a city green in the village or something yeah, like that. That's true. I, that may not be possible because that uh, presumes an opportunity, which right. may not be there. Right. And we wouldn't have to take those funds. This is just we won't have to take the bond money if we pass a bigger umbrella of bond money. Uh, a recommendation and some advice is, and you'll get this from my esteemed counsels here, mm -hmm. we all will lean towards a vaguer actual resolution and then the detail done by separate entities. So for instance, and I'm just going to toss out a, let's pick 25 as something north of 20 and south of 30 for park acquisition and development. And that would be how the ballot question would be phrased and it would encompass these projects and it would then, the detail from that can be worked out with, again, as I say, separate entities. Okay, so I think you have some guidance. We can work with this. Is there anything else y'all need from us? So we've said not worrying about, they've said not worried about the trails at this point, correct? If you put, and then the parks, so on this spreadsheet, all the trails are showing up as parks, but we don't, we're not going to talk about those. We want to just see what it looks like for the parks, Roberts Drive, Burmack, the little things at Brook Run, finishing Waterford potentially. And I would, I would keep on the parking lot with the dry land modifications because at, at the, at the, um, at, at the art center. We should stay for that. Well, uh, Mayor, if uh -huh. I may, for a moment, is that okay? Okay, the, um, so when we bring that back to y'all in a couple of weeks, one thing that, you know, I'd like for y'all to think about between now and then is, you know, the absolute size of it, because that's one thing we're talking about. That will shape itself to a degree, but also if you, if you want more money for land acquisition, be thinking about that because the time frame is short now. We can come up with a, with a good list, but be thinking, you know, there are some variables in those numbers as far as how robust you want the park portion to be, how much land acquisition you want to do on top of that. So, I th so I think, you know, I'm just guessing, are we still between like the 20 and $30 million number? You don't have to answer that tonight, but just think about that. So when we do bring the resolution, we can fill in the blanks for y'all to look at. And uh, I will defer also to Madam Clerk and Madam City Attorney. It would not be improper for us to place four separate items on the agenda of different values, 20, 30, 40, and 50. And if they voted no on three of them and approved one of them, that one would carry. Yeah. So, so what the law, uh, Jay, I'm going to answer it in an indirect way. You don't have to issue every dollar that's approved if you don't get there, but it would be better to have the number, you know, and I'm using, I'm not saying not to exceed, but it's better to have a higher number that you can meet the goals of whatever it is that you might do in a capital program because of the unknowns than to pick a low number because it sounds good and it won't get it done. If it takes 22 million, 28 million, 32 million to complete whatever something you might approve that the voters approve, 
we don't want you trying to lowball that number because you don't have to issue what you don't need. Uh, and, and eventually it just fade off because it's only good for a certain period of time, I think, Tommy, under statute. And so uh, the problem is the interconnectivity of these. What, what I think Jay's saying, and look, we can ask as many questions as you want, but if question one is, if question two is dependent upon part of one, you don't want voter confusion where what y'all's plan is is very unique but one passes and one fails and then suddenly it's like well how do you do this so we'd like them to be self-contained silos and parks can be a self-contained silo and if you're going to put a project list out you got to follow your project list if you're going to have it more generalized you have more flexibility uh but i i, I just want to make sure you don't have to issue every dollar of what is approved but you do have to complete a list if you have a list if that makes sense and just to be clear even if that specific list is not on the ballot but is listed on a city website we are still bound by that list that's posted is that correct yeah okay so once you approve the resolution anything you cycle out is part of the, the supreme court has essentially said you can't have a, a broad valid question and then have something that you've been putting on letterhead out in these town halls that the, the voters can rely on that as if it merged into that ballot question. So we don't want you putting anything out until you either agree, all right, we're going to have a specified list or specified topics, parks and rec, for instance, and parameters around that development, design, acquiring of land, building, constructing, equipping, et cetera. But once you put a list out, then it, bec it becomes part of the question if it's formal. So we tell Jay, anything until y'all approve, stamp, not approved by the city of Dunwoody. So nobody can rely on that until y'all actually finalize whatever it is y'all are gonna do. Does that make sense? The reason why Jay's pushing y'all a little bit is we're running out of compression time to get it on a ballot. That's the real, we yeah, know. that's the real issue. So I, but I think the question Jay was asking, just to rephrase, is is it if, if for some reason staff felt like they were a little vague on what we wanted, could they bring four different resolutions with four different amounts to the meeting next sure. time, and we could vote them down or up? And you can change them while we're sitting here. We can change them. On, we, we can get a slide and insert and change and make sure y'all are getting what y'all want for sure. And in fact, Jay has several templates that we've already started that process. But I think he'd like to winnow it down to not having 20 templates and maybe have four or five or less, if that makes sense. A, su a suggestion to council is that we will prepare four separate resolutions that give the only question to be parks, acquisition and development of different amounts of 20, 30, 40, and $50 but, million. Dollars. But I'm not being rude, but there's not $50 million worth of parks projects. So I, I don't think you have to stuff the agenda. I think you can, once we get the reports from the parks department, the estimates on the Austin design and the Vermac, whatever, that you can start looking at those numbers and come up with something realistic. I, I'm not okay. about vagueness at all. Um, Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I think that number should be guided by the project list and not the other way around. Right. I, I think we were not trying to find as many projects as we can get for $30 million. We're saying, this is our, these are our priorities. This is what it's going to cost in a real, to your point, in a realistic fashion, accounting for potential inflation and, you know, other uh, unexpected expenses, uh, making sure we have enough to actually fund them. And then, uh, then that should drive the number, not the other way around. That, that, that helps with, with that. If we're, if we're working on that scenario. Yeah, I agree. So does that help? It does, and we will try to get you something for f informal feedback very soon because part of this is we are under somewhat of a time constraint. Okay, what I'd like to do because of open meetings and open records is I'd like the committee, that the, oh my gosh, we've been at this meeting too long, the capital improvement, what do we call y'all? The capital committee, which is advertised, would have a meeting with you and whoever. That will be- To go will over, it's open to the public, the rest of council can attend if they want. And so um, that would be good. I'm trying to remember who's on that one. That's Catherine, Rob. No, no Catherine, Catherine, John, John, and Joe. Okay. Catherine, John, and Joe. Okay. We will schedule that 
tomorrow morning. Not for tomorrow morning, but we will find a time. Right, because I'd like them to vet it. Um, and then we'll go from there. I don't want it to sound like the death knell for paths. And no, no, I, it's, no, it's you not. Know, I, I know that you and Joe, Tom and Joe met with Path Foundation and I love the idea of their inclusion right. and guidance. And I think they'll help us with all, a lot of issues that we've talked about, but don't know the answers to. So right, a bright future. Right, and I, and I think that some of the projects on here, like the 285 stuff, we're just not anywhere near putting a shovel, not even just a shovel on the ground. We can't even begin to imagine what they're going to look like. Yeah, no, I, I completely so understand the concerns. The and parks. Are I think we need a, a master trail plan, and perhaps that could be a part of it. Although that might get it confusing as well. But right. because that that's something fund that we can a master point to. trail plan. This is, I mean, anyway, okay. Well, but before that's we push forward with a, a trail system, yes, I think project, right. we need that. Right. We need to. I would clearly define what we're trying to do. Okay. A suggestion on things like that is as we work through the 2023 right. budget process, that's the type of project that can be added through general fund. The, the only one more point I just want to write, sorry, I thought we were all fine. done with this. No, that's Because fine. I just want to make sure that we're all comfortable with what we're going to present to the public as far as, because my, my, what I'm hearing and is that we want to provide, and I agree with the public, with as clear a picture of what we're intending to do with this bond money. But at the same time, from a, I guess, a legal standpoint on the ballot question, we want to perhaps be a little bit vague so that we're, so I, I just I just want to be clear that the direction we're giving as far as what the public is going to, what our project, how specific is our project list going to be, and how specific is that bond question going to be, and I, because because that's going to, I think, going to be the, the the decision maker on the 20 whatever yeah 25th whatever yeah and i think the only thing i say councilman lambert is really the legal is not pushing vagueness we're pushing broadness so that it fully encompasses what you could do mm -hmm. so you have flexibility i just want to so anything that we discuss in the meeting i just want to be clear if we're discussing and we come up with a project list and we discuss that in the meeting is is that are we obligated to what is discussed there? I, I think we need to be as specific as possible. And that's why I bring the point up. So I think you can do it though, like with each park. The good thing about just doing parks is that these are not new projects to us. We've talked about them, we've vetted them, we've had public meetings, we're making changes, whatever. And we come up with the list of what we intend to do on each property. I think that works, right? I mean, so something where we could say we like want there to be a splash pad at this park, but we don't need to say it's going to be right here. Right. We're not going to put a design out, yeah. but we know like at Brook Run, the three things that we should be the last things we do there, the bathroom, whatever they were, the bathrooms, the picnic pavilion, and the third thing, maintenance facility. We know that. And so we, there's just no reason to say anything else. And, I, and the same thing with Winwood Hollow, I think we'll know what playground, what I called it wrong, Waterford um, playground. I mean, that's where we are with those parks. We're in good shape in terms of specificity because we've done the work. So, so was that clear? We can work with this. Yes, right. So one or two, we, will, get, we right. will make this work. One or two, you know, if you need to bring, if there's a bottom number and a top number and you want council to choose, you can bring two resolutions, but don't bring us four. Okay, two. Cool. Okay. That's more than one. Yeah, not a, no, right, don't, right, okay. All right, everybody, anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Chief Carlson. And while he's coming up here, I want, if we proceed with the bond, the good thing is, is that the citizens get to vote. Mm -hmm. They get to give us the council direction. So that's one way to look at this, direct democracy. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council. Um, I am uh, up here to talk about the replacement of our primary duty weapon. Uh, currently we are carrying the Glock 21, which is the 45 caliber. Um, over the years, I actually have the same one uh, from when I started here. So what we're 
uh, what we're seeing is a, a lot of wear and tear on these weapons. Um, so what we're doing is looking to replace them. So what we did was we took our firearm staff um, to do some testing and evaluations on a new system. Uh, what they came up with uh, was the Glock 17 with a modular optic system that's mounted on it. Uh, what we did is uh, our North Metro SWAT team, the majority of those members use it because of the other agencies that we are partnered with. Um, and uh, we uh, incorporated it into our 2022 spring firearm session. So what we did was we took our shooters that shoot, you know, an average 80. We took our midline shooters that were closer to 90 and then our high-end shooters as well. And we ran through our qualification course. And what we saw was that their pre precision uh, increased. So uh, not only is it uh, more cost-effective with the ammunition because it's nine millimeter ammunition, we also carry that as a backup. If you all, some of you all remember that we switched to the backup nine millimeter uh, system a few years ago. So it's gonna be consistent with one type of ammunition as well. Um, and not only that, we are going to the, uh, it's called an Aimpoint Red Dot Reflex site. And uh, what you'll see now is a lot of the weapons, rather than, than your traditional iron sights, it's a red dot that you get on there. So uh, you can acquire your targets quicker. Uh, you're gonna be more accurate um, and a lot faster. Uh, not only that, the officers will be, uh, will be able to carry an extra 12 rounds uh, on our person as we uh, go into duty. So the total cost uh, to do something like this is uh, $63,759.07. Um, we do have the option of trading in uh, our Glock 21s. Um, so that would um, that cost right there includes the, um, the trade-in of the pistols up for $19,500. We also give the officers the option, mine has my badge number, I'll be able to purchase it if this were uh, approved. Um, at this time, I'll take any questions. Anybody? I just have a quick question. And was this a state contract? Because I don't see bid sheets or anything. I'm just curious. Maybe it could have possibly been in there. Yeah, the we go through the Smyrna Police Distributors, which okay. is just a yeah, full access to the price, and we we use that. But, but Mike, that that is on state contract. That's part of the contracting system. If you could just confirm that before we, will, we, we vote will. on it, we'll thank confirm. you. We'll confirm that. Um, okay, anybody have any other questions? Nope, thank you for bringing this to us. It should not be. Thank you, Mayor. And you can put it on, con if, if we can put this on consent, I think, and just make, uh, make sure that's in the memo, please. All right, we're ready for the next one. I don't know if you had to announce it or not. I'm sorry. Oh, no, nope, because this is just discussion. Okay. Um, so uh, the next thing I would like to discuss is uh, to authorize specialized unit pay for the police department. Uh, as you know, um, you know, patrol officers, when they start, um, that's basically the foundation. Um, once the officers get into um, their niche, if you will, if they, some of them like to do traffic, some of them like to do SWAT, some of them like to do investigations. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of uh, extra training. Um, uh, schedule changes, being on call. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it rather than just your foundation um, as a patrol officer answering your calls. So our specialized units, uh, they total approximately 50, well, it's, it is 15 officers, and that includes detectives, community outreach, the crime response team, canine, and uh, a task force officer with the high intensity drug trafficking area group. So what we're uh, wanting to uh, give as an incentive, and not only that, just more of, uh, of retention. Some of these officers don't like to go the supervisory route, which, you know, obviously that will give them pay increases, but we want to give, give them something to strive for, something specialized, uh, and something for them to look forward to, you know, and, and make it more competitive for them to join these specialized units. And that's why we were looking at um, giving them an additional 4000 a year, um, uh, to be a part of these units. And it's because the demand on them is so much greater. Um, the remainder of 2022 um, uh, would be approximately $30,000. So for 23, it would equate to about 60,000. At this time, I'll take any questions. And, and Mayor, if I can add something yes. to what the uh -huh. statement. Well, this is something Thanks. that I'd asked the chief and 
and the deputy chief to take a look at, because what one thing we're seeing with retention, this was a retention effort, is to say is to have some separation amongst the different specialty duties. And so those are listed out in here. Um, and, and that was one thing when people do leave, they say, hey, there was an opportunity for advancement. And these are smaller steps because it's not as much, quite as much as going up, but they are incremental steps. And that's why we came up with this list. And I think it's very important uh, to have those different levels. This is in keeping with what say Sandy Springs does. I know if they're canine yes, sir. And, and other things of that nature. Correct. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, does, does the SWAT team already have a specialized unit pay or, or some other? They do. They have a twenty five hundred dollar uh, incentive pay. Okay, which is below this. So is is there or is that an appropriate level for them or? Uh, it is. That's what we initially came up with um, uh, due to the hazardous duty pay that they, um, you know, have to endure. The uh, looking at it, there's only one that would qualify. For both. Um, the chief said he'd discuss that when he returned, if in fact, in other words, it's a detective who was also on the SWAT team. It'd only be one individual. So we would look at 6,500 or a base 4,000 for him for being a part of that specialized unit. I'm not sure but, that's what Tom was asking. Yeah, but I guess it's again. like, are we, are we going to be, uh, is, would it be appropriate to bump the SWAT up to the, the 4,000 here as well? I would say so. Yeah, it are, is, is, are, but I didn't see them included on the list. So we, we didn't, but I can I would think, you know, of, of any of the specialized units, they, they'd probably be the most uh, most in line for that uh, that additional pay. So I, I, that would be my recommendation. Um, Stacy or oh, Catherine had something. Yes, is this uh, equitable for canines since they have to house and feed the it dogs? It is. Right now, we only give them uh, one hour extra pay um, uh, per day, um, which we don't think is nearly enough. I mean, that's a 24 seven job, uh, even when they're off duty. So, um, but canines are included with this 4,000. Yeah, so. and I'm just, again, wondering because they have to talk house and feed the animal, yes, is that, is it really? Should it, it be it, higher is, is what she's asking. Yeah. Should she be higher? That's what she's asking. I mean, that's something I would have to discuss with the chief and city manager, but I mean, it is a 24 seven okay. job. You know, they, they do enjoy it. You know, it's a member of their family. They, you know, um, but it is, mm -hmm. you know, washing, feeding, taking do, out. Do we cover food? I mean, I know that's a strange we, we question. Get it, we get it. We budget for it every year, but we get it free from oh, right. uh, one of our uh, local. local. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. That's, that's good. So I, go ahead. Sorry. One thing I wanted to add to um, the, 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 the chief was telling me before was that SWAT's part-time you know, that's a part-time part assignment versus like the canine, some other, they're full-time assignments. So the pay is adjusted accordingly to that. Do you want to explain that any deeper or as far as the SWAT, I mean, what that means versus- okay, So yeah, so they're basically on call. Um, granted their call volume has gone up right. uh, this past year. We served a warrant at five o'clock this morning, um, but it's, it's 2,500. Uh, for the year since they only train twice a year and then they're on call basically 24 so okay so I think what we're asking y'all to go back and look at is 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 it equitable right it, it, so you don't have to answer me sure. today fair enough just look fair at enough. it got it and figure out maybe what our neighbors do I'm big on that figure in terms of competitiveness or sure. whatever and then um so I understand what you're saying we just want to know back Fair right. That's Thank fair. you. And if whatever y'all recommend. Yes, ma'am. So this won't be consent. If we could just have it as a as an uh, a business item, please. Anybody have anything else on this one? Thank you for bringing this to us. Thank you. Very we much. appreciate it, and we pay their vet bills, though, right? The dogs. Okay, yes, just making sure. Grooming. Um, All right, so that concludes discussion, unless anybody has anything else. Seeing none, uh, public comments. We ha have another public comment section. You can have three minutes. Uh, we'll ask you to fill out, a, you can come speak, and then if you'll fill out a card um, afterwards just so we can have it for our record so if anybody would like to speak come on up and you can introduce yourself oh you have a card if you'll give it to this young gentleman right here no, no will you do it yeah the microphone 
I'm sorry. I, I just had one quick question. Um, the the increases that were discussed, I'm in complete favor of, mm -hmm. but um, are they just a bonus or are they also tied to other benefits so that those those increases carry forward on a pension or other benefits that the person would benefit by longevity remaining with the, the city and uh, have a... So we're not supposed to have a conversation under open meetings, open records, okay. but we will have that answer at our next meeting. Okay, thank you. Good question. Hello, Nancy Nicodemus. I've learned a lot tonight. I'd leave you with this question. Are you running a city or a park and trail system? That list of capital projects was very revealing as was your discussion. Again, according to the article posted on your website, the cost of maintaining our current parks is already 6.7 times what was originally budgeted in 2008. We've also established we don't have enough revenue coming in to cover our current operating costs. Every $1 of additional money you're considering to acquire parks will require money to operate and for what you call programming costs. I think if you're gonna put a bond before the citizens of this city, about getting new parks or expanding trail systems, you owe us a clear picture of what the budget's gonna look like in future years when you want to increase the millage rate above the cap you've already decided to put in place. So I, you know, it, one of the projects up there was listed as transportation. It was replacing the sidewalk at the linear park on Peeler Road. I don't know if any of the council members have walked on that, I've walked on it many times. It's not highly trafficked. Everyone's cordial. If there's a bike or something, people figure out how to let other people pass. That's $1.5 million right there we can save. So again, think about what we voted on when we voted for the city. And it seems like it's a lot of your time tonight and maybe it's just tonight's agenda. We spent about park, talking how you're running a park and trail system. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, uh, seeing none, next on the agenda is city manager comments. Uh, Mayor, the only comment I have tonight is that we will need a brief executive session for legal, um, litigation, real estate, and personnel. Okay, somebody. All right, council comments. Anybody, Tom, Rob? So I wanna thank everyone involved um, in the parade, our annual tradition and Deputy Chief Carlson, please thank your office, the officers that served us so well. Um, many of you all probably know what happened just as our parade was ending in Highland Park. And so, um, we keep that community in our thoughts. Um, and, but again, we appreciate all the volunteers. It's a huge effort between the volunteers and our police department to pull that off every year. And uh, we're very grateful. And with that, I need a motion for executive session for everything. Go ahead. I move that we um, enter, an exe enter into executive session for purposes of legal litigation, real estate, and personnel issues. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we will adjourn to executive session and then we will be back eventually. What is this?
Sharon. I need a motion, please. Move to adjourn. Move by Stacy. Second by Rob. Any discussion? Seeing none, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.